importante, nobre, da Academia Brasileira de Ciências, de pegar temas que sejam relevantes para a ciência e também para a sociedade brasileira. E, como vocês sabem, hoje em dia o tema das mudanças climáticas, da geoengenharia climática, é um tema de alta relevância no mundo e de especial relevância para o Brasil. E essa relevância aumenta na medida em que ocorrem contestações à ciência, contestações à evidência científica sobre as mudanças climáticas. E aí a obrigação da academia responder a isso com ciência. Né? E com ciência, esse é um trocadilho óbvio, né? porque ela permite também ter consciência dos danos né? que essa, esse, essa posição anti-ciência pode causar à humanidade e ao Brasil em particular. Então, acho que nós vamos ter uma oportunidade aqui de afirmar a importância da ciência, de afirmar a evidência científica, que é a melhor maneira, no momento, de resistir a esse obscurantismo internacional, nacional, né, que contesta a evidência científica em várias áreas. Outro dia eu vi uma foto muito interessante, de um, simulada, né, de um eclipse lunar, em que a sombra da Terra na Lua aparece como uma placa, em vez de um círculo. Então, é, o pessoal, quer dizer, dá, isso motiva muitas brincadeiras, é, mas realmente é uma questão muito séria para nós aqui no Brasil, em outros países também, e de modo que nós damos boas-vindas a esse simpósio, que tem um significado muito especial em virtude disso que eu falei. A Academia Brasileira de Ciências tem feito várias publicações sobre temas relevantes para a ciência brasileira. Uma das últimas publicações foi um, chamada Projeto de Ciência para o Brasil. É um livro que está disponível na página da Academia para, fazer, para baixar gratuitamente. É, é um livro volumoso e que, para minha surpresa, teve a adesão de cerca de 180 cientistas que trabalharam nesse livro. São 16 capítulos, não são disciplinares, são, são temáticos, sobre temas altamente relevantes. Inclui mineração, energia, ecossistemas, clima, né? Amazônia, é, ciências básicas, né? nanotecnologia, cérebro, né? tem um capítulo sobre inovação, e, e sempre cada capítulo exibindo o estado da arte e depois propostas de política pública. Então, essa é a função da academia, discutir questões científicas relevantes e vocês estão ajudando a gente a fazer isso hoje. Então, bem-vindos, é, com muita alegria que a gente hospeda né, esse, esse simpósio aqui na academia sobre tema tão relevante. É, agradeço também aos nossos visitantes que vieram de fora, longas viagens, para participar desse simpósio, é, agradecendo a eles a participação. Eu passo, então, a palavra para o, o nosso colega aqui, que vai é, falar também sobre a conferência. É, os dois colegas aqui vão falar so, sobre ela. Então, por favor. Ah, entrando aqui nessa sala, eu me lembrei, acho que uma vez deve ter sido no começo dos anos 80, provavelmente lá por 83, 84, que eu vim aqui numa reunião sobre clima. E me chamou a atenção na época, naquela época, as mudanças climáticas ainda estava assim no, no começo, né? sobretudo aqui no Brasil, dessas discussões do meio científico. Né? E a, a, a academia, a, tradicionalmente, já vinha a, conduzindo uma série de discussões sobre temas científicos, às vezes negligenciados pela própria a, academia, né? pelo meio acadêmico, a, e que por alguma razão, eram importantes. E eu me lembro claramente dessa primeira reunião aqui, deve ter sido em 83, uh, na qual uh, houve uh, 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 o objetivo era chamar a atenção da, dos professores, pesquisadores que aqui estavam, né, sobre a importância do tema, como isso seria muito importante, importante nas décadas que, que viriam aí na frente. Né? De fato, né? Aí depois eu me lembro, uh, pré a Rio uh, 92, também uma série de reuniões que foram conduzidas aqui, visando justamente a uh, agregar a comunidade brasileira em torno do tema. Né? E assim por diante, e vem vindo. Uh, acho que, apesar de Kyoto, apesar de Paris, uh, as coisas não vão bem, né? 
quando você olha os cenários de emissão uh, de gases de efeito estufa uh, que estão sendo observados hoje, uh, é muito perto dos piores cenários que a gente tinha lá atrás, né? há algumas décadas. Ou seja, uh, tudo que está sendo feito ainda parece não ser o suficiente para conter o aquecimento em níveis uh, que sejam minimamente uh, sustentáveis. Né? Ou seja, alguma outra solução tem que ser dada. A geoengenharia surgiu exatamente dessa forma e cheia de, 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 de grandes uh, incertezas. Né? Não é uma coisa nova. Estava até comentando com o Paulo Artacho que, nos anos 70, por exemplo, houve uma iniciativa aqui no Brasil para se conduzir um processo de mudança climática no Nordeste, para fazer chover no Nordeste, baseado em pulverização na atmosfera com uh, carbono, né? o black carbon. Uh, isso chegou ao nível da, da presidência, na época. Estava contando para ele de uma reunião em fevereiro de 80, lá em Brasília. Uh, a gente tinha, isso foi uma iniciativa uh, do pessoal da, uh, ligado ao Instituto lá da, do ITA, né? da, da, do IEA, na verdade, o uh, IAE, Instituto IAE, lá no, no, em São José, e, as tantas, uh, nós fomos chamados a, a Brasília para discutir a proposta, porque envolvia um custo enorme, era a aquisição de uh, cargueiros uh, 747, né, Boeing 747, para pulverizar com pó de carbono ali no litoral do Nordeste. Vocês vejam, isso foi... Começou essa proposta nos anos 75, 76, por aí. Quando chega em 79, estava lá para ser aprovado esse processo. Quando chega no começo de 80, uh, alguém teve bom senso de consultar a comunidade científica e fomos lá nós, lá em Brasília, contar sobre as incertezas desse processo. E o resultado foi interessantíssimo. No final dessa reunião, quem presidia era o Goberi, que alguns de vocês ainda se lembram dele, e o Goberi, as tantas, disse, olha, gente, não vamos fazer, dadas as incertezas desse processo, mas estavam ali para assinar a contratação desse projeto. Ou seja, já a engenharia não é uma coisa nova, está é, cheio de exemplos, inclusive a gente faz até de forma ah, ah, meio sem controle, né? de colocar aerossóis na atmosfera, que resfriam a atmosfera, bota gases de efeito estufa que aquecem, Tá certo? Ou se, e, e com tempos de residência muito diferentes, os gases e os aerossóis. Ou seja, é um negócio é, muito perigoso né? para todo o funcionamento do sistema biogeoquímico do, do, nosso, do nosso planeta. Né? Então, foi em cima dessa, dessa perspectiva de que algo terá que ser feito. A preocupação com a questão da governança. Né? Ou seja, a, nos preocupa muito a ausência do Brasil na, no processo de discussão sobre esse tema uh, nos fóruns internacionais. Uh, foi essa a motivação que, essencialmente, nos levou a organizar esse evento aqui na academia, né, nessa nessa sala, tá certo? que tem essa tradição de ter sido uma sala onde uma série de assuntos importantes foram, pela primeira vez, uh, debatidos de uma forma visando a a, a, a aglutinação da, do, dos nossos cientistas em torno de temas relevantes. Então, uh, espero que a gente atinja o objetivo no sentido de divulgar o tema, uh, discutir o que está acontecendo no resto do mundo né, e ter perspectivas de como caminhar uh, aí para frente. Então, dito isso, eu passo para o Paulo para falar sobre a estrutura do evento. Né? Isso. Bom dia a todos, gente. É, quando eu e o Pedro estavam pensando em organizar uma coisa, um simpósio como esse que nós estamos organizando agora, a primeira pergunta é, será que, nós, será que vai ter alguém interessado em discutir isto? Né? Será que um tema é tão esquisito? Né? Vamos reconhecer que esse tema é estranho, né? para dizer uma palavra. Né? Esquisito. Quer dizer, a pergunta que nós vamos tentar discutir hoje e amanhã é, será que nós temos um plano B? para as mudanças climáticas globais? Esse plano B é viável? Quais são os efeitos colaterais desse plano B? Né? Se nada der certo, será, do ponto de vista de redução de emissões, será que nós vamos é, ter alguma saída com geoengenharia climática? Né? São perguntas que, num grupo muito pequeno 
e fechado de cientistas, a gente se pergunta ao longo dos últimos 15, 20 anos. Mas como agora as mitigações de emissões não estão dando certo claramente, eu acho a gente discutiu e viu, olha, é bom a gente começar a colocar um tema tão estranho, tão esquisito quanto esse, Uh, será que nós podemos deliberadamente mudar o clima do nosso planeta? Qual é o risco? Uh, quais são as consequências científicas? E, principalmente, que nós vamos discutir no dia de amanhã, o dia de hoje é voltado para discutir os aspectos científicos dessa questão, que são extremamente complexos, como vocês podem ver. Envolve ecossistemas terrestres, envolve oceano, envolve atmosfera, envolve balanço de radiação e assim por diante. E amanhã nós vamos focar na questão da governança deste processo. Né? A governança é extremamente importante. Vamos imaginar que um Trump, ou o governo da China, ou o governo de um país, resolve unilateralmente mudar o clima do planeta como um todo. Isso é possível, em primeiro lugar. Né? Isso é factível. Né? E quem decide é, que mecanismos usar, a intensidade e assim por diante. Isso são questões que estão na fronteira, tanto da ciência quanto da governabilidade do planeta, e uma das funções da Academia Brasileira de Ciência é trazer essas fronteiras para o grande público, colocar em discussão os prós e os contras, e disseminar as ideias mais malucas que podem ter. Algumas dessas ideias de geoengenharia climática são realmente meio malucas, né? vocês vão eh, tomar contato com elas, e colocar isso para discussão para o grande público. Então, esse é o objetivo desse, desse encontro, nesse tema que, com certeza, está ficando cada vez mais importante na questão das mudanças climáticas globais. Então, acho que isso daí, esperamos que isso fique claro nesse simpósio hoje e amanhã, e que a gente traga novos elementos na questão das mudanças climáticas globais extremamente relevantes para o futuro do nosso planeta. Paulo Artacho, pela coordenação, pela organização desse evento e desejar a todos vocês uma bela conferência que seja útil para todos os participantes e também para a sociedade em geral. Muito obrigado. Então vamos ao programa. Vamos lá. Vamos colocar esta, esta primeira apresentação. Ela é voltada né, para tentar responder uma pergunta que talvez vocês uh, estejam fazendo na cabeça de vocês. O que, que nós estamos fazendo aqui nessa reunião? Qual é o nosso papel aqui? Né? E, basicamente, é uma discussão sobre uh, a exploração da ciência e da potencial aplicabilidade de uh, geoengenharia. Né? Então, o que, que nós estamos fazendo aqui nesta sala? Bom, isso tudo começa com... Primeiro, temos que entender que a ciência da mudança climática hoje é extremamente sólida. Em que aspecto? Por exemplo, aqui estão a capa de alguns relatórios soltados, digamos, nos últimos seis meses, eu poderia colocar mais uns 10 ou 20 relatórios aqui, sobre biodiversidade, sobre impactos globais na América Latina, sobre como limitar o aquecimento em um grau e meio, os relatórios do IPCC, da WMO e assim por diante. Né? Então, a ciência hoje é, se intensificou enormemente nos últimos tempos. E tem uma razão para fazer isto, é que os impactos possíveis das mudanças climáticas estão começando a ficar cada vez mais claro. E uma das razões disso é isto é o aumento das emissões de CO2, né? É, desde na último, nos últimos 15, 20 anos. O que está acontecendo é que de 2017 para 2018, as concentrações de CO2 subiram 2%. E 
E de 2017 para 2018 subiu 2,4%. Ou seja, nós não só não estamos conseguindo estabilizar as concentrações, como elas estão subindo a taxas cada vez mais altas. Isso é uma realidade. Né? Nenhum país está conseguindo realmente atingir as suas metas do Acordo de Paris. E a grande pergunta é para onde vai essa curva? Hoje nós estamos emitindo cerca de 40 bilhões de toneladas de CO2 para a atmosfera a cada ano. Ou seja, estamos mudando a composição da atmosfera terrestre. E esse aumento da composição da atmosfera terrestre tem um impacto na temperatura. E esse impacto na temperatura varia sobre os oceanos e varia sobre os ecossistemas terrestres. Mas uma coisa que eu quero levantar é que, por exemplo, já agora, nós, sobre os ecossistemas terrestres, o aumento da temperatura já é de 1,5 graus centígrados e 1,2 graus centígrados, globalmente falando. Ou seja, aonde nós vivemos, nós já atingimos 1,5 graus Celsius. E isto é importante e tem uma série de impactos sobre a nossa sociedade. Só que quando nós falamos de 1,5 graus Celsius média do planeta, nenhum de nós vive na média do planeta. Nós vivemos numa localidade. E veja o que, que acontece. Por exemplo, você pega o Nordeste brasileiro, esse é o aumento observado de temperatura nos últimos cento e poucos anos, e o Nordeste brasileiro já se aqueceu entre 2 a 2,5 graus Celsius, o que é um aquecimento muito importante para qualquer ecossistema. Algumas regiões do Ártico já se aqueceram 3 graus centígrados. Veja, isso não é projeção do futuro, isso não é resultado de modelos, são resultados de medidas em milhares de estações meteorológicas. Ou seja, o nosso planeta está num, num, numa rota de rápido aquecimento e essa rota vai ter uma série de impactos. No Brasil, por exemplo, a última compilação do Berkeley Earth Group para a média brasileira é 1,6 graus centígrados. Ou seja, nós já ultrapassamos aonde a gente vive, o tal do 1,5 um grau e meio que a ONU estabeleceu como um limite que poderia ser seguro do ponto de vista de aquecimento global. Então, esse é o cenário que nós estamos lidando hoje com a questão das mudanças climáticas globais. Se a gente olhar, por exemplo, a distribuição espacial deste aquecimento na América do Sul, vocês vão ver, olha, o Nordeste brasileiro, e a bacia do Rio São Francisco, com aquecimentos da ordem de 2 graus e meio. Né? Várias fontes diferentes estão reportando basicamente a mesma coisa. Este gráfico da direita mostra anomalia de precipitação. Então, em algumas regiões do Nordeste brasileiro, já está chovendo 30% a menos do que chovia digamos, há 100 anos atrás. Está chovendo mais aqui no sul do Brasil, particularmente na Bacia do Prata. Isto, não preciso dizer para vocês, que vai ter impactos socioeconômicos muito grandes. Em particular, há uma importante região onde produz-se alimentos no Brasil, pode ter queda significativa de precipitação, trazendo impactos econômicos enormes para nós. E o futuro, o que, que nos espera? Bom, nós estamos aqui emitindo cerca de 40 bilhões de toneladas de CO2. Para onde nós vamos? Se nós vamos continuar emitindo nesta taxa e chegar no final do século emitindo 100 bilhões de toneladas de CO2 por ano, é um cenário possível. Ou outros cenários que o IPCC está colocando, de você começar a partir de 2020, reduzir essas emissões até ter emissões zero e, a partir daí, começar a retirar CO2 da atmosfera. Veja que, entre esses cenários, há um mar 
de uh, possibilidades diferentes. E os cenários futuros de temperatura, por exemplo, essas são é estimativas de aumento de temperatura, de que se nós continuarmos emitindo na taxa que temos emitindo hoje, a temperatura futura no Brasil pode aumentar alguma coisa da ordem de 5 graus centígrados. Né? Então, o que, que, que isso significa? Uma cidade que nem Cuiabá, que no verão atinge facilmente 41 graus, começar a atingir 46, 47, 48 graus. A semana passada, tivemos uma onda de calor na Índia, com 51 graus uh, de temperatura, expondo milhões e milhões de pessoas a um clima muito perigoso para a saúde humana. Né? Então, nós temos que evitar esse cenário o máximo possível. Como evitar esse cenário? Principalmente reduzindo emissões. Agora, a pergunta que esse simpósio lida é e se a gente não conseguir reduzir as emissões? Temos algum plano B? E qual, quais são os impactos deste plano B? Né? O aumento esperado de temperaturas para o Brasil de acordo com simulações do INPE também vai muito nessa direção do aumento esperado pelo IPCC, um aumento de temperatura de 6 a 7 graus, vejam, em toda a região onde nós produzimos grãos e é o motor da economia brasileira. Né? Então, vocês percebem que o impacto é, não é pequeno, é muito grande sobre a nossa sociedade. Né? Além disso, quer dizer, existe um conjunto enorme de evidências das mudanças climáticas, e esse conjunto enorme de evidências mostra que as mudanças climáticas estão se acelerando muito rapidamente. Mais rapidamente do que, inclusive, o IPCC pre eh, previa nos seus relatórios. E uma das questões é, quão perto nós podemos estar de uma mudança de, de clima realmente que possa vir a ser catastrófica, ou o que a gente chama o tal do tipping point. Quais são esses tipping points? Os tipping points são o seguinte, por exemplo, no caso da floresta amazônica. Né? A floresta depende de chuva e ela está numa região tropical que é vulnerável ao aumento da temperatura. Tá? Se a precipitação diminuir e a temperatura aumentar muito, é possível que a floresta não consiga se manter como tal. Se isso acontecer, a floresta armazena da ordem de 150 bilhões de toneladas de carbono e parte desse carbono pode ser mobilizado para a atmosfera e, com isso, piorar ainda aqueles cenários que já não nos são muito favoráveis. Né? Mas também temos, ah, por exemplo, mudanças na circulação termoalina, ah, desestabilização da, da, das massas de gelo no oeste da Antártica, ah, quebra do sistema de monsum que regula as chuvas no subcontinente indiano, ah, perda de metano no permafrost e assim por diante. Estes... Estes tipping points, eles não são incluídos nos modelos climáticos. Tá? Por quê? Porque os modelos climáticos, em geral, eles levam em conta a linearidade, ou leve não linearidade, do sistema climático. E a gente ainda não sabe quão perto estamos destes chamados tipping points. Podemos estar perto ou podemos estar relativamente longe, o que nos ganha algum tempo nessa questão. Entre os tipping points importantes está a perda de metano do permafrost eh, de toda a região ártica, e esta perda é um feedback muito importante. O metano é um gás que é 28 vezes mais forte do que o CO2 para fazer efeito estufa, e grandes quantidades de metano hoje estão sendo lançados do permafrost do Canadá e da Sibéria, que estão derretendo. Então, isso é um feedback positivo e, possivelmente, nós vamos ter outros feedbacks positivos que a gente ainda não conhece do sistema climático terrestre. Né? Um dos, um dos, uma das facetas mais visíveis das mudanças climáticas é o aumento da frequência dos eventos climáticos extremos, 
Então, eles estão ocorrendo, na verdade, isso é uma compilação desde 1980 até 2017, da frequência dos eventos climáticos extremos. Basicamente, nós multiplicamos por quatro a frequência desses eventos climáticos extremos. Cheias aqui no Rio, que vocês viram ao longo dos últimos dois meses, secas importantes em São Paulo e outras regiões, estão ocorrendo com uma frequência cada vez maior e muito bem documentadas hoje. Então, nós estamos alterando a frequência desses eventos climáticos extremos. Uma das questões mais delicadas... Na, nas mudanças climáticas, que eu acho que é importante a gente enfatizar, é qual é a nossa capacidade como sociedade de alimentar 10 bilhões de pessoas em 2050. Nós somos 7,5 bilhões de pessoas hoje e seremos 10 bilhões em 2050. Este gráfico é do World Economic Forum, ele mostra a, a mudança na produtividade agrícola entre o momento atual e 2050, que mostra que o Brasil e a Argentina podem ter perdas de produtividade agrícola da ordem de 20% a 30% por causa da mudança climática. Isto vai prejudicar, obviamente, a nossa capacidade de produzir alimentos para 10 bilhões de pessoas em 2050. Outra questão importante associada com a questão de mudanças climáticas, é a perda de biodiversidade. E, entre todos os continentes, basicamente, a América do Sul é o continente que mais vai sofrer com a perda de biodiversidade como, que tem como consequência das mudanças climáticas globais. E isto tem impactos muito importantes sobre o funcionamento de todos os ecossistemas. Né? O IPCC fez recentemente um, uma análise sobre como nós podemos fazer para limitar o aquecimento a 1,5 graus. Né? E, basicamente, a, as, a, as conclusões desse relatório são de que, para fazer isto, a partir de 2020, ou seja, ano que vem, nós vamos ter que começar a reduzir as emissões de CO2 em 5% ao ano, tá? até 2050. E zerar as emissões em 2050. Isso significa uma mudança absolutamente drástica na, na maneira da gente produzir bens de consumo, produzir energia e assim por diante. Né? Este relatório de IPCC, além de tudo, ele levanta, eu vou mostrar nesse outro slide, ele levanta quatro cenários diferentes, onde, basicamente, um cenário onde, a partir de 2050, nós vamos ter que começar a sequestrar CO2 da atmosfera. Se a, gente, se a gente atrasar muito a redução, nós vamos ter que remover CO2 da atmosfera a uma taxa da ordem de menos 20 gigatoneladas de CO2 por ano. Só que tem um detalhe. Não existe tecnologia ainda disponível para remover CO2 da atmosfera nessa escala que vai ser necessária, de acordo com o relatório do IPCC. Portanto, estes cenários de emissão negativa, que é essa parte amarela, que basicamente lida com a questão da agricultura, de florestas, porque o único processo conhecido de retirar CO2 da atmosfera nessa escala chama-se fotossíntese. Tá? Então, plantar árvore ajuda a remover CO2 da atmosfera? Sim. Só que, obviamente, nós vamos ter que retirar 20 gigatoneladas de CO2 por ano, continuamente, e haja terra para você conseguir plantar árvores para conseguir remover esse CO2 nesta escala. Então, existem outras... Outras técnicas que vão ser discutidas amanhã à tarde, por exemplo, retirar CO2 da atmosfera e enterrar em depósitos geológicos, que pode vir a funcionar no futuro também. Mas hoje, a única maneira é realmente remoção de CO2. E o que é importante é que os riscos associados com as mudanças climáticas para o funcionamento do ecossistema, para a agricultura, eles, esses riscos aumentam 
conforme a temperatura vai aumentando. E se a gente tiver um aumento de temperatura de 4 a 5 graus, basicamente, em todas as maneiras com que a gente for olhar dos riscos chaves, perda de biodiversidade, os sistemas do Ártico e assim por diante, todos esses sistemas vão ficar comprometidos com um aumento de temperatura de 4 a 5 graus. Então, é um cenário que nós temos que evitar o máximo possível. A pergunta é, é possível evitar esse cenário? Então, o professor Alan Robock vai discutir algumas das técnicas que, eventualmente, poderiam ajudar a gente nessa tarefa. Né? Bom, e para finalizar, o Acordo de Paris é o único acordo hoje uh, em funcionamento. E se todos os países uh, atingirem as suas metas, o aumento da temperatura ainda vai ser em média de 2,7 graus. Lembra? 2,7 graus, aumento médio no planeta. Em áreas continentais, isso é um aumento da ordem de 3,5 graus. E, se a gente olhar aqui, 3,5 graus está mais ou menos aqui, onde você já identifica um alto risco de insustentabilidade do nosso sistema socioeconômico. Né? Isto se todos os países cumprirem as suas metas. Brasil provavelmente não vai cumprir suas metas, Estados Unidos também, Alemanha provavelmente também não. Né? Então, são metas que provavelmente a gente não vai atingir. Então, a pergunta é, e agora? O que é que a gente faz com essa batata quente é, em cima, da, na nossa mão? Tem um outro aspecto que é muito pouco discutido. Né? A função da ciência é trazer para o grande público é, novos aspectos nessa questão. Hoje, os aerossóis atmosféricos, eles mascaram o aquecimento global, é, porque eles resfriam o planeta. Acontece que, para lidar com a questão da poluição do ar, as emissões de material particulado estão sendo reduzidas no mundo todo, não é só no Brasil. Né? Veículos elétricos com menos emissões, indústrias que estão sendo fechadas, poluidoras, sendo trocadas por usinas fotovoltaicas e eólicas, e assim por diante. Esse, esse mapa aqui mostra, basicamente, que o efeito direto e indireto dos aerossóis é em menos 1,2 watts por metro quadrado. Ou seja, nós estamos esfriando o clima com os aerossóis em 1,2 watts por metro quadrado. Todo o efeito dos gases de efeito estufa é uma forçante positiva de 3 watts por metro quadrado. O que isso quer dizer para a gente? Quer dizer que, ao reduzir a poluição do ar nós vamos estar aquecendo o planeta 30% a mais do que ele já está aquecendo hoje. E isso é uma coisa que vai acontecer, já está acontecendo, na verdade. Né? Então, se você... Esse mapa mostra o aumento da temperatura, se você parar de emitir combustíveis fósseis e parar de emitir material particulado. Vocês vão ver que o aumento da temperatura médio global, vai ser da ordem de 0,7 graus, além daquele aquecimento que a gente viu dos gases de efeito estufa. Portanto, nós estamos na situação de vamos despoluir o planeta, mas isto aumenta a temperatura do planeta pela redução dos aerossóis atmosféricos. Isto é uma questão muito importante, já está ocorrendo e vai se intensificar uh, no futuro. Então, para terminar, o que é essa tal de geoengenharia climática? É um conjunto de medidas que tentam é, fazer uma manipulação em grande escala é, deliberada do meio ambiente planetário para a, combater a mudança climática antropogênica. Quais são essas técnicas? Nós só vamos discutir aqui hoje, amanhã, algumas delas. Tá? Então, basicamente... É, colocar espelhos no espaço para refletir uma fração da radiação solar, colocar aerossóis na estratosfera, né, imitando o que os vulcões fazem, 
refletindo uma parte dessa radiação, aumentar a cobertura de nuvens, fazer, mudar o albedo das plantas para que elas reflitam mais radiação de volta para o espaço, fazer fertilização com ferro solúvel nos oceanos para as algas absorver CO2 da atmosfera e assim por diante. Né? Podem parecer técnicas malucas, tá? mas elas, a gente talvez tenha que considerar todas as possibilidades para a gente não, basicamente, bagunçar todo o clima do planeta. A pergunta é, será que algumas destas técnicas não bagunçam ainda mais o clima do planeta do que já vai acontecer? Então, essas várias, várias discussões hoje de manhã vão tocar nesse tópico. Né? Então, nós temos, desde, é, basicamente, aumentar a perda de calor, redistribuir a energia do nosso planeta, basicamente, diminuir o ganho de energia. Então, tem uma série de técnicas que vão ser discutidas hoje. Alan Robock vai tocar em algumas delas em detalhes, que estão sendo consideradas pela ciência. Né? Então, basicamente, elas se dividem em duas, em duas partes diferentes. Um, remover CO2 da atmosfera e mudar o balanço de radiação do sistema terrestre. Essas são as duas principais técnicas que nós vamos discutir nos próximos dois dias. Tem uma enorme literatura nesta área, né? documentos da Academia uh, Americana de Ciências, documento da Academia de Ciências da Inglaterra. Nós mesmos publicamos um artigo do IGBP alguns anos atrás sobre os impactos ambientais. Nós publicamos no ano passado um artigo na Nature falando do papel dos países em desenvolvimento na questão de geoengenharia e assim por diante. Então, a ciência hoje está progredindo uh, de maneira importante nesse tópico. E amanhã nós vamos dedicar para a questão da discussão da governança. Né? A governança ela é chave, né? porque quem vai controlar este processo de implementação dessas técnicas meio malucas? Né? Quem controla esse processo? Os países em desenvolvimento, onde está a maior parte da população do nosso planeta, pode e deve ter uma voz ativa nesse processo? E como fazer isso? Né? Então, o Andy Parker amanhã vai discutir esses aspectos que são igualmente importantes junto com os aspectos científicos. Né? Então, basicamente, a mensagem dessa introdução é vamos discutir algumas ideias meio malucas, porque nós precisamos, podemos vir a precisar delas se a humanidade continuar nesse caminho meio maluco que nós estamos das mudanças climáticas globais. Tá ok? Então, obrigado pela atenção. Então, eu já gostaria de chamar a primeira palestra. Do professor Alan Robock da Rutgers University dos Estados Unidos. O Alan ele trabalha há mais de 25 anos é, desenvolvendo modelos e coordenando trabalhos globais sobre o modelamento do impacto das mudanças da, da geoengenharia nas mudanças climáticas globais. Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paulo, for inviting me to come here to give this talk. And uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, solar geoengineering. So some of this will be a quick uh, repeat of what Paulo just said. Uh, this is a graph of the global average surface air temperature. Uh, I, let me first discuss the problem that we're trying to uh, address. Uh, this is, we can see global warming. But Although CO2 has been going up regularly, the temperature has not been going up regularly. So how can we explain this? Well, first of all, let's eliminate the bad data from World War II. Uh, the first half of the 20th century, we had warming because there were a lot of volcanic eruptions before then, and then they stopped. And so part of this warming is a natural uh, warming as the atmosphere got cleaner. 
And then after World War II, there was a lot of uh, tropospheric aerosol pollution, as Paolo mentioned, uh, which has blocked out the sun and counteracted the effect of greenhouse gases. But the atmosphere stopped getting dirtier, and then the greenhouse gases have dominated for the last part of the 20th century and up until now. So we can see, th this gives the idea about geoengineering. If volcanoes can cool the climate naturally, why don't we do it on purpose? Or if you can make the troposphere, the lower atmosphere, more reflective, why don't we do that on purpose? And so these are the ideas of, the, of geoengineering. And just, just to give you, explain why we're worried about this, this black curve here is what I just showed you. This is the temperature change of the last 1,500 years from proxy data, mainly from tree rings. And this is what we have to expect if we don't do anything. Climate change to a temperature never before experienced by humanity at a rate never before experienced. So it's, it's a real emergency that, that we're trying to deal with. So global warming, in 10 words, this is my elevator speech. It's real, it's us, it's bad, we're sure, but there is hope if, uh, if we can uh, use uh, change technologies. And so uh, this is the situation we're in. We want to be happy, and so to be happy we get things, we get stuff, and that requires energy. And a lot of the energy is generated by burning fossil fuels, by burning oil and coal, and that produces emissions of carbon dioxide. About half of that stays in the atmosphere for a very long time, and that causes climate change. And then that affects uh, us and ecosystems, and that has a negative feedback on our desire to be happy. So we're sort of stuck in this feedback loop, and the question is how do we break the loop? So first of all, we could have less stuff, or we could uh, use energy more efficiently, or we could generate energy from the wind and the sun. These are all green. This is called mitigation in the jargon of IPCC. And we know how to do it, it's just not happening very fast. And so absent that, we have these ideas of geoengineering. And there are two, as Paolo mentioned, one is to try and take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and the other is to block the sunlight, which we call solar radiation management. Now these are different. Uh, the first one, uh, and then absent that, we, we have to adapt to the climate change, and absent that, we have suffering. So this is where we are. And these two geoengineering techniques are different. The first one is more like treating the illness, if you use a medical analogy. You're trying to take out what's causing the climate change. And if you could do it on a large scale, uh, not cheaply enough, and, to, uh, and find a place to put it, that's probably a good idea. The other is like treating the symptoms of a disease. And so if you do that, you're still not solving the initial cause of the disease. And that's, that's the topic I want to talk about. That's solar geoengineering. So uh, this was already given by Paolo. The definition is deliberate, large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract anthropogenic climate change. So it's large-scale. It's on purpose uh, to try and change climate. And Paolo showed this. This is actually from a paper by David Keith in 2001. So it's not a new topic. And there's various techniques that we're people are considering. The US Academy of Sciences had a publication four years ago now, and they broke it up into two different books. One was called Reflecting Sunlight to Cool Earth, and the other was, that's uh, solar radiation management, the other was called Carbon Dioxide Removal. And so uh, this was sponsored by the US National Academy of Sciences, the US Intelligence Community, NASA, NOAA, Department of Energy. Actually, the CIA put in most of the money for this study. Why do they call it climate intervention? Why don't they call it engineering? And they said, well, if we call it engineering, it makes it seem like we know what we're doing. So we're, not gonna, we're gonna call it intervention, which means we're trying to attempt something and we're not quite sure. Uh, it's an action to improve a situation. We're not quite sure what will happen. This is really geoengineering, moving Earth around. But we're stuck with the term, so, so we have to live with it. So these are the main ideas of solar radiation management. One is to put something in space to reflect sunlight. And these ideas are very expensive and very uh, kind of uh, unsafe, and, and nobody takes it very seriously to do that. 
The next is to, is to emulate a volcanic eruption by putting particles in the stratosphere. This is the technique that people co are considered uh, studying the most. Another is to take clouds in the lower atmosphere and then seed them by injecting particles, and that would make them brighter. And this is something people are also considering. And finally, there's uh, re increasing the reflectivity of the surface by painting roofs white or engineering crops or painting the deserts white. This is also not considered very seriously because it would require large-scale efforts, and once you make, paint something white, it gets dirty again, so, so it's not taken e seriously. It's, it's these, uh, these two, st stratospheric aerosols mainly, and cloud brightening that are the things that are studied most. So this is where I live in New Jersey, and you see these white lines, this is New York City, the, you see these white lines in the clouds. These are called ship tracks and under clouds that emit sulfur and other particles that can make more but smaller particles, and that produces uh, uh, brightening. But it doesn't happen everywhere, so you can see uh, where there are thick clouds, you don't see them, where there are no clouds, you don't see them. And so it's a, a lot of research to try and figure out under what conditions could this actually work uh, and be effective. So th uh, some people, Latham and Salter, have invented this boat, which doesn't exist, but these are, these are sails, and they pump so salt water up and produce a mist, and this, in theory, will seed the clouds. Uh, there have been some studies, this was one done by University of Washington, uh, Wang et al., where they modeled what would happen if you sailed a ship under these clouds in the ocean. And this is with no ships, this is with three ships, this is with one ship, with a very detailed climate model. And you can see that if you put salt in, the clouds get brighter, but next to the clouds, the clouds evaporate. You get this upward motion, you get sinking nearby, and so the net effect might not even be in the right direction for you. So how to do it under what types of clouds is a very uh, important research area. Uh, a climate model that did this found that they seeded the clouds in the places where these clouds exist, which is off the west coast of South America, North America, and Africa. And one of the results was a huge reduction of precipitation over the Amazon. So you get these regional patterns. And so whether this is a general effect or not remains to be seen. Now, it's not a new topic. This was a report to uh, President Lyndon Johnson in 1965, so more than 50 years ago, a report on the quality of our environment. And Appendix uh, Y4 was about carbon dioxide. Uh, Roger Revelle was the chairman, Wally Broker, uh, Joe Smagorinsky, uh, Dave Keeling were authors. The climatic changes in, produced by CO2 could be delirious to the from the point of view of human beings. What do we do about it? And one of the ideas was to, uh, uh, was to uh, uh, change the reflectivity of the Earth. Such a change in albedo can be brought about, for example, by spreading very small reflecting particles over large oceanic areas, and this might actually inhibit the formation of hurricanes. So they were talking about these different ideas uh, more than 50 years ago already. Uh, Mikhail Bodika, the great uh, Russian climatologist, in 1974 published a paper. You see the uh, title was Controversial Issues. And he talked about influencing the aerosol layer in the lower stratosphere, so emulating a volcanic eruption. So th this has been uh, thought about for a long time. And then Wally Broker wrote a paper called SO2, sulfur dioxide, which is what you would use to create sulf sulfuric acid droplets a backstop against a bad CO2 trip. And that was uh, the jargon of the times. Uh, and uh, he wrote it and sent it around to people and said, Wally, we don't want you to publish this. It's too controversial. Uh, just, just, just don't talk about it. Uh, it'll take away any action on mitigation. So he didn't publish it. And this whole topic was sort of uh, forbidden to work on because it was too controversial. Uh, until in 2006, Paul Crutzen, who has a Nobel Prize in chemistry, said, I don't see any mitigation going on. Maybe we should consider geoengineering. And he's one of the world's experts on ozone depletion. He, he knew that these particles would deplete ozone. And then Tom Wigley from NCAR wrote a paper that same year in science looking at a simple climate model. And so this sort of opened the gates to people starting to do research on the topic. 
And so they had a meeting at NASA uh, Ames Research Center to discuss this on the weekend. And uh, the director and I got myself invited to it. And there were these people there saying, oh, this is a great idea. We're going to engineer particles, and we're going to control everything. And there were these physicists and engineers that were, had all this hubris, thought they were going to control everything. They didn't quite understand the climate system and natural variability. And I started writing down. So the, 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 uh, that week, uh, uh, Rolling Stone came out. I went to dinner with a friend of mine. Uh, uh, she said, did you see the latest Rolling Stone? I said, yeah. My two favorite guys are on the, no, no, look at the top. Dr. Evil's plan to stop global warming. And inside there was an article about Lowell Wood, who was the right-hand man of Edward Teller, who built the H-bomb. And he said, uh, 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 we c y you can uh, stop global warming no matter how much oil we burn. And so uh, he was there talking about what, how great an idea this was. And I started writing down why it might not be such a good idea. And so I ended up with 20 reasons, which I published, and now I've come up to 28 reasons uh, why it might not be such a good idea. But I've also had reasons why it might be a good idea. And you shouldn't count the number on each list. You should just look at them. Number one reason is it would reduce surface air temperatures. It would reduce global warming. So if you could do this, it would reduce global warming. And is that a good enough reason to live with all the risks. That's what we're trying to figure out. We need to quantify each of the benefits and risks. So if in the future society is to do this, they can make an educated decision. And these include uh, uh, drought in the African Asia, uh, more diffuse radiation, ozone depletion, uh, continued ocean acidification because you wouldn't do anything about the CO2. And then all the acid you put in would come out as acid, rain, and snow. Uh, it might not stop the ice sheets from melting, impacts on chemistry, rapid warming if it stopped, and, and so forth. And so I'll t I'm going to give a talk after lunch and go through how we sort of quantify this. I just want to mention how you could uh, uh, calculate this. And so one of the way ways we can study these is with climate modeling. And we've set up a, a group called GEOMIP, Geoengineering Model Intercomparison Project, which I'll talk about in the next talk. And you can address some of these issues. Uh, you can certainly see the, the climate response. Uh, you can see all the climate response and some of the human impacts. Uh, another way you could address it is by looking at volcanic eruptions as an analog, which I've been studying my whole career. What do they do to climate? And there are many examples of how they can uh, both c cause cooling and de deplete ozone and so forth. So I'll talk about that later. Uh, so uh, then the other question is, can you do it? Some people claim it's cheap and easy, and that's, but imperfect, and that's why it's dangerous, because it's so easy to do, and we have to worry about people doing it without thinking about it. But I think that claim remains to be proved. So, so uh, how do we get aerosols up into the stratosphere? So we did a, a paper, we calculated, how would you get them up there? Probably from a mountaintop would be easier, you're closer to the stratosphere, you can put up balloons that will burst and uh, with full of sulfur gas. You can even build a tower into the stratosphere, it turns out. Uh, uh, you could fly airplanes. You could use naval guns, which were discussed in uh, uh, a long time ago. So uh, how would you do it? And so this, art this was in the New York Times a couple days ago. I don't know. Can you, uh, can you click on the, on the picture? And I don't know if I can do it. Uh, it, it moves. Well, it doesn't matter. The, 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 so they have this balloon with spraying stuff out, and uh, uh, somehow the gases move, but the balloon doesn't move. And uh, it also talked about uh, pumping water onto ice sheets or, or uh, building walls around Antarctica. Those are pretty, pretty uh, 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 crazy ideas. Uh, how would you get the stuff up to the balloon? So. Uh, we calculated how much it would cost to actually send airplanes up, and that seems like the cheapest way. And we got a, a $3 billion a year, and then uh, another group, the Aurora F Flight Group, did a report also, and, and they got uh, similar answers, uh, $1 to $10 billion a year to get 1 million tons of material up into the atmosphere. The, uh, since then, there have been a couple papers that have tried to quantify this more. So. Uh, this paper by Wake Smith and Gernot Wagner said, uh, 
no existing aircraft design can fulfill this mission. So you can't take existing airplanes and put bigger engines or bigger wings on. You have to design a new class of airplane, but they think it could be done. And if you do that, you could uh, get, they, they got $2.5 billion per year, which, uh, which but they were, weren't pretty very much up there. So it's an average of uh, 0.7 teragrams of sulfur per year for $2.25 billion per year. Then a group in, uh, in Holland designed an airplane uh, as part of a, a class project, and they, uh, uh, the question is, uh, how much sulfur do you want to put up? So here's a result from Niemeyer and Timrek showing how much radiative forcing you get for how much sulfur per year. And so let's say we want to, doubling CO2 is about four watts per square meter. So let's say we want to cut that in half, like a few recent papers. Let's do minus two watts per square meter. So if we do that, then uh, uh, th what they concluded, by the way, is if you want to counteract all the global warming by the end of the century, you'd need the equivalent of five to seven Pinatubo eruptions every year. So every two months, you need a, a big Pinatubo eruption, getting uh, uh, 100, 100, 100 uh, teragrams of sulfur per year. But we, uh, nobody thinks that that makes any sense at all. So let's take a minus two, and that gives you 12 teragrams of sulfur per year. So how much would that cost? So based on these four papers, it depends. How do you get the sulfur up there? Do you send it up as H2S, which doesn't weigh very much, but it's very nasty stuff? Or do you send it up as SO2 gas, which is what volcanoes do, uh, which would give you 24 teragrams of, sul uh, of sulfur per year, of SO2 per year? Or do you send it up as sulfuric acid already, which would give you 37 teragrams per, per year? So depending on what you do, you get on the order of 50 to 100, 200 billion dollars a year. And that's just for minus two watts per square meter. These are all theoretical calculations. I think uh, we really have to test whether and how easy it is to do that and get particles like we like. So that's, again, is, is 100 billion dollars a year a lot of money or, or not? It's, you know, the prof annual profit of Exxon. So uh, uh, what's one way of gauging it? So it still might be cheap, but I think the technology really still needs to be tested. So let me just end by talking about the recommendations. Do you, is anybody timing me? Do you know? No, it's not working. <laughs> uh, so uh, let's, let's just, just look at the recommendations of the uh, National Academy report. They had six recommendations. One of them was uh, we really should do mitigation and work on adaptation. And everybody who works on this understands that we understand what the solution to global warming is. It's mitigation. It's leaving the fossil fuel, leaving the coal and oil in the ground. And we know uh, and, and change our energy source. And th they, they recommend that because we, we know about this. The second recommendation was to do research on carbon dioxide removal and disposal at scales that matter. And so a year ago, they published a research plan to do carbon dioxide reduction. And so people are trying to then now get funding to do, the, to do this research. But it's been sanctioned by the National Academy. The uh, third recommendation was we should not do albedo modification at this time. And they list some of the things that are on my list, uh, decreases in ozone, changes in patterns of precipitation, no reduction of the root cause, poorly understand regional variability, potential risk of long-time dependence. And they also discuss the uh, governance, political, social, legal, economic, and ethical dimension. So we shouldn't do uh, geoengineering uh, in the solar geoengineering at this time. The fourth one was that we need a research plan on albedo modification. And so they've just put together a committee which is met for the first time a couple weeks ago, and ne next year we'll produce a research plan on stratospheric geoengineering. And we hope then that that will get some money out of the US government to try and support this research. Right now, there's not very much money at all available for the research. The fifth one, which was the CIA recommendation, which was uh, we had to improve our capability to detect and measure changes in rate of forcing and associated changes in climate. Uh, a few years ago, seven or eight years ago, I got this phone call from two guys said, hi, we're working for the CIA. 
can you ask, answer a question for us? Okay. If some other country was trying to change our climate, would we know about it? And I thought about it, I said, well, probably we would, because if the, you put a cloud in the stratosphere or brighten clouds over the ocean for long enough and on a large enough scale to actually change climate, we could observe those changes. Thank you, goodbye, click. <laughs> and then I thought, you know, they're probably asking me another question, too. If we wanted to control somebody else's climate, would they know about it? So uh, the Environmental Modification Treaty prohibits any environmental modification for hostile purposes, but it's never been invoked. So, uh, but we do need, uh, we scientists agree, we need better satellites and LIDARs and balloons to measure the stratosphere. Everybody agrees on that. And finally, there should be uh, serious work on governance. So what types of governance, research governance, uh, should be needed, and governance of research as well as implementation. So if we go back to my list of possible uh, risks and benefits, all the things in orange now cannot be addressed with either modeling or using volcanoes as an analog. These are the hard things, especially for scientists. How do we ever quantify uh, how much it would be worth to uh, environmental impact, uh, uh, commercial control? Whose hand on the thermostat? If we could control the climate, uh, what country controls it? How do we decide what temperature we want the planet to be? Uh, and it could even be used for, uh, and there could be societal disruption, conflict, uh, and uh, the, this moral hazard idea. If we thought it would work, we'll b we have less push to do mitigation. There's also errors, unexpected consequences. So, of course, we have to have unexpected benefits over here. Uh, <laughs> unknowns, by definition, are unknown. Uh, but human error during implementation. So, if anybody was in an automobile recently, you wore your seatbelt, so you understand this concept. Anything built by humans, anything operated by humans can fail. So would you trust the whole planet to one of these very complicated technical things? And so nevertheless, we need to try and quantify these. And I'll just end with the, the napkin diagram. So there was a meeting at Asilomar more than 10 years ago about this. and. John Shepard said, this is my idea of how it might ever be used. And so this is, a, uh, this is business as usual. Uh, this is mitigation. We try and reduce the emissions so we get less global warming. And then we try and take some of the carbon dioxide out. And so we get the temperature down to here. But as Paolo showed, if it gets too warm, we still might want to lower the temperature. And this we use the SRM. And then we are uh, left with two degrees warming, and then we have adaptation, impacts, and suffering. So the question is, this is, you would do it for a short, but in this, people that show this diagram now don't draw the axes on, don't label the axes, but he did. And this was like for 150 years. Is, is, does that make any sense? And the question is, even if you did this and got less warming, would it make more dangerous than if you didn't do it at all? So. Uh, here in Rio, 25 years ago, the uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed, and the w countries of the world pledged to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. And so the, when they did it, they thought that that was about the effects of greenhouse gases, but I think we also have to include geoengineering in our pledge to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. Thanks. Thank you, Alan, for this nice talk. Uh, a ideia é fazer esse seminário o mais interativo possível, né? Ou seja, esses temas requerem uma discussão muito ampla, o mais ampla possível. Então, uh, alguma questão importante, alguma questão relevante, pode fazer em português para mim que eu faço a tradução para o Alan. Sim?
Next time, give the mic because she couldn't hear him. Oh, yeah. Translate. Oh, uh, yeah. É, tem um microfone ali porque senão a tradutora não consegue fazer a tradução. Yeah. Uh, a observação dele foi. Oh, sorry. His observation was that the governance is a critical issue, and that's exactly what we are going to discuss the whole day tomorrow how to establish a governance system. There are people who will come here to talk, to discuss exactly what you talked about for many, many years, and wait until tomorrow, and we'll have the answer for your question. É, meu nome é Ronesier, eu represento um grupo de pesquisa Estação X, e eu gostaria de saber é, quais seriam as principais patentes e a quem pertence essas patentes da geoengenharia para aplicação no Brasil, por exemplo. The scientists working on this want all the want all the uh, research to be open without any patents, and so everything is is being published. And they, I don't know of any uh, people that are trying to make money on this. But commercial control was one of the things on my list. What if a big multinational corporation is doing this, and you say you have to stop? No, no, there's a job in your country, a job in your country, and they. They influence pol policy to continue to do it, just like uh, that's why we have this problem, because the fossil fuel companies are so powerful that they uh, prevent us from, from switching to other things. And so that commercial control might be a, a problem, but I don't know of anybody, most of the, all the scientists I know are trying to do this openly so everybody can, can have access to the technology. Thank you. É, bom dia, senhor. É, eu gostaria de saber, a China e os Estados Unidos devem é, produzir a maior parte dessa, dessa poluição. E o Brasil, com desmatamento, também deve estar poluindo agora uma, uma parte grande, porque o desmatamento cada vez aumenta mais. E isso tudo estaria ligado ao consumo, Diminuir o consumo, porque a mídia só faz e cada vez aumenta. Querendo que nós consumimos, consumamos cada vez mais. Diminuindo o consumo não seria talvez a alternativa mais a ideal para controle disso? Porque é, da maneira que a coisa está indo, o preta terra não vai aguentar. Né? It's not just consumption. When you talk about climate change, it's how much. CO2 is put into the atmosphere by, and using the atmosphere as a sewer without paying for it. So uh, you can, uh, if you can generate energy with, electric, with sun, with solar panels, or with wind, that will not cause uh, climate change. And so there's lots of other issues with consumption and waste and so forth and plastics, but with, when it comes to climate change, if you uh, flush your toilet, you have to pay somebody to take the waste away. If you throw your, out your trash, somebody has to be paid. If you just dump carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it's free. No, you don't pay anybody. It's an invisible gas. You can't uh, smell it, so it it's, doesn't bother anybody as pollution. And so if there was a gradually increasing carbon tax where you had to pay for the emissions, that would be a huge incentive both to produce the technology to get energy without dumping CO2 in the atmosphere, and also to, uh, if the money was returned equally to all people, then if you emitted less than the average, you'd make money on the deal. So a huge incentive not to burn CO2, because uh, you wouldn't have to pay for it, and also to develop the technology. And that's, uh, that's worked in the past for other air pollution uh, uh, types of things, and so that's a way to do it. And it's not about no consumption, it's about consuming in a sustainable way. Yeah, maybe he can. Yeah, it's in English, and then uh, if I were a CIA agent and I call you and say, you have one minute to summarize the pros and cons, would you do it? I mean, if we got 
to this trajectory, which is pretty clear, it's unavoidable. So what's your own personal judgment? Should we begin to engage in this, or the, 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 the downside of these uh, technologies are greater, or what's your own assessment? I agree with all the recommendations of our National Academy report. We should not do it now. We don't know how risky it is. We still have to do research to see the bene potential benefits and potential risks. And so sometime in the future, people are tempted. They'll know what they're doing. They won't say it's an emergency. We have to do it. Don't worry about the problems. And, I'll, and in my t next talk, I'll tell you about, about all, all, a lot of the problems and what they potentially are. So uh, not, not do it now. And uh, the question is, is there a plan B? And if, if we do this research and find out that it's going to be too risky, that will put a larger pressure on doing mitigation. So uh, we have to work as hard as we can on mitigation right now, no matter what. Naquele diagrama onde a naquele diagrama onde aparece a quantidade de de calor, a variação de calor, deveria aparecer a variação é, da população e da energia é, gasta no conforto dessas pessoas. Assim, a gente estaria vendo que as curvas estão próximas. Ou seja, é, há que se é, calcular a quantidade ideal é, de pessoas que deveriam existir. Não defendo que morra ninguém, porque nós já morremos. Quando fomos mais velhos, nós já morremos. Mas é preciso que haja menos nascimento, no sentido de que haja uma quantidade ideal. Porque, se nós deixarmos acontecer é, que a curva do crescimento populacional vá direto, quando é que vai ocorrer um colapso, como guerras e todas as outras coisas? Falta de recursos, por isso. Então, é preciso olhar nessa direção, está bem? Do you, do, 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 you, do you have any children? Do you have any children? W would, you like, would you like somebody to tell you how many children you can have? You would like to... creio que daria para equilibrar. Agora, deixando, deix, deixando ocorrer é, uma, uma liberação total, vai ocorrer um colapso. Isso aí não tem nem como fugir disso. Por falta de recursos, por falta de tudo, áreas de plantio. So, con controlling population is a difficult question. It's, there's a lot of cultural issues involved, different, some religions, uh, Orthodox Judaism, uh, Roman Catholicism don't want any controls on, on people. So uh, it's not just the number of people, it's the number of people times how much they consume. So if we can reduce the emissions per person, then the number of people won't be as important. And so I think uh, China controlled the population, and now they find out they don't have enough people to do all the things. And so to support. So I, I'm not, I think we should work on it from the viewpoint of the technology rather than trying to control people's decisions. And as people get wealthier, of course, they have fewer children. And so if we can bring everybody to the standard of living that we have, they can have a refrigerator, they can have lights at night, and uh, they can have air conditioning uh, driven by non-fossil fuels, then, then uh, the world will be a better place. And that's a huge incentive to produce that technology. Yeah, a few, a few decades ago, there was a significant investment in the nuclear winter scenarios. In other words, for those in the audience that are not familiar with, uh, you know, the scenarios produced by a generalized uh, uh, nuclear war during the uh, Cold War period. As a result of those studies, which provided terrible scenarios for our planet. Uh, I think 
it helped um, speeding up the process of controlling or at least uh, regulation of nuclear war uh, uh, warfare. Would you say that um, we're following a similar path? I hope so. You know, I was I was one of the people that worked on nuclear winter, and there was a team in Russia and a team in the United States, and they got the similar results: a nuclear war. The smoke from the fire started by the bombs would go up in the atmosphere and cause so much climate change that temperatures would get below freezing even in the summertime and sentence the whole world to starvation. And these results were presented to Mikhail Gorbachev and to Ronald Reagan. And both of them, I have quotes from both of them saying, scientists from both sides told me this was going to happen and we trusted them because it wasn't propaganda just from one side and that made them realize how crazy the nuclear arms race was and they stopped it and the number of weapons started going down and down. And so that was a very important way for science to inform policy. Unfortunately, the number of weapons in the world today is still enough to produce nuclear winter and so the problem isn't solved, although there's a treaty two years ago in the United Nations to prohibit nuclear weapons based partly on our work and 23 nations have signed it so far and so it, it, it's going in the right direction. That's the whole IPCC process is trying to do that same thing. And, and the Framework Convention has these conferences of the parties every year. The third one was in Kyoto, and the Kyoto Agreement only restricted emissions from developed countries and didn't work very well. The one in Paris, I think, was the 21st conference of the parties. And so we're going in that direction, just not fast enough. But if we had leaders who would make this a priority around the world, and explain to people why you have to uh, invest in this now for the future, that would work. And, and we're trying, we're, we're trying to inform people, but I hope that will work in the same way. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. Um, now we're gonna to, uh, switch gears, switch the subject. So we'll discuss the hydrological and potential hydrological impacts of geoengineering by Ines Camiloni. She is from the University of Buenos Aires uh, in Argentina. Well, good morning. Thank you to the Academia Brasileira de Ciencias for the invitation and also to Pedro and, and Paulo to be here today. So my presentation is related, as, as you see in the, in the title, about the possible hydrological impacts of solar radiation management in, in La Plata Basin. So this is the, the outline of, of the talk. I will present some the main issues related to La Plata Basin, what we know about climate change in, in the basin, and finally three points related to a, a project where we are exploring the, the impacts of solar radiation management in, in the basin. I will present the motivation for this project, the, the main goals of, of the project too, and also the prelim preliminary results we, we already have. So let's start with La Plata Basin. This is a transboundary uh, basin in southeastern South America. Uh, this basin is shared by five countries, uh, Brazil, Paraguay, Bolivia, Uruguay, and, and Argentina. And it's a quite relevant region for the economies of, of these countries, also because of the water availability for agriculture, river navigability, and also for hydroelectric production for, for these countries. It has three main rivers. These are the annual mean discharges of, of this river, the Paraná, the Uruguay, and also the, the Paraguay River that is um, that tributes their, its waters to the Paraná River. And some of the features of, of this basin that it covers more than three, millions, the three million square kilometers the population of the basin is more than 150 million inhabitants. It has uh, about 75 dams, more than 30 large hydropower plants also, and uh, very important ecosystems like the Pantanal, the Ibera uh, wetland in, in Argentina. So what we know about climate change in, in La Plata Basin? 
This is the way that precipitation has been changing if we compare these two periods, 1981-2010, compared with this 50-year period. And what you can see is that there we have water conditions in, in this area in southeastern South America that covers mostly all La Plata Basin. And if we want to explore uh, the forcings for this uh, increase in precipitation in, in the basin, uh, this, this uh, paper shows that it's mostly related to the increase of greenhouse gases coming from fossil fuels, from, from the burning of, of fossil fuels. So we can attribute this, this uh, positive trend in, in La Plata Basin mainly to anthropogenic activities. And the impact of this uh, increase in precipitation in, in the basin is, appears also in other um, climate uh, parameters like temperature, but also in river floods and, and floods that became more frequent in, in the basin, in some of, of the rivers of, of the basin. And here you can see a positive trend in the Uruguay River discharges at this station in, in Argentina, Paso de los Libres, and also a positive trend in the annual discharges in the Paraná River in, in this point, Corrientes, also in, in Argentina. And if we want to know about the future scenarios of, of the basin, this scenario with the more extreme increase in greenhouse, in greenhouse gases concentrations shows that the, we can expect that the weather conditions will continue for the rest of, of the century. And if we consider these two scenarios under 1.5 and 2 global warming worlds, this is what we agree under the, the Paris uh, Agreement. This is what is in some way acceptable to us or, or to our governments that signed this, this Paris uh, Agreement. These are the, the two worlds, sorry. The 1.5 world and the two degrees world with uh, different warmings in continental areas and in the oceans. And these are the precipitation changes that we can expect under these two degrees of warming. And if we look at in, in this detail of South America and in La Plata Basin, what we can see is that under both uh, scenarios, we can expect an increase in precipitation. And this paper shows changes in uh, discharges of different uh, rivers in the world. In particular, for the Paraná River, what they show is that bo for both scenarios, mainly associated to the increase in precipitation, we can expect for a 1.5 world an increase of around 5%, a, a little more than 5% of the river flows, of the annual river flows, and uh, for to, for a two degrees world, we can expect an, an increase in the flow of around 10%. So, about uh, six months ago, we started with this project. May, I think they, uh, the details of, of the funding of this project will be presented later by, by Andy. But it's a project that was funded by SRMGI. And we are exploring the impacts of solar radiation management in, in La Plata Basin, the hydrological impacts. We are four researchers from the University of Buenos Aires and the National Research Council of, of Argentina. And we also have two collaborators. One is Simon Tilmes from ENCAR and Peter Arban from uh, the Harvard University. And the motivation for, for this project. This is the target that it was uh, agreed under the, the Paris Agreement. 
in 2015 to limit global warming around these two targets, 1.5, the, the most restrictive target, or two degrees. And according to the national determined contributions, where we are now is at this point, we can expect by the end of the present century a global warming of more than three degrees. And if we compare with the current pathways, where we are according to the greenhouse gases emissions, and also the changes in Indian use, by the end of the century, the global warming would be around four degrees. So, if we want to limit the warming to 1.5, we can follow different pathways. This is the, in some way, the ideal pathway. If we want to limit the global warming to 1.5, we can expect temperature to increase and to, at some point during this century, to stabilize in, in this uh, value. Under this condition, we have a previous analysis about changes we can expect in La Plata Basin. Here you have the changes in the annual precipitation, the annual evaporation, the annual runoff, and also discharges at these uh, closing points in the Paraná River at Itaipu and the, in the Uruguay River at Salto Grande. For two emission scenarios, the RCP 4.5 and the RCP 8.5. And, and, and what we found is that under the RCP 4.5, what we can expect is an increase in precipitation in most of La Plata Basin and also an increase in evaporation and increase in runoff. But this leads to an increase in the flows of both rivers, both for the Paraná and both for the Uruguay River. But if we consider a high emission scenario, the RCP 8.5, the changes we can expect are different in the basin. We expect a, a significant reduction in precipitation in the northern part of, of the basin, an increase in the southern part. And this, is shows, this shows also an increase in evaporation, and uh, sorry, a decrease in evaporation and decrease in runoff in this uh, northern part of the basin and increase in the southern part of the basin. Then, and this leads to a reduction in the flows of both rivers. So we can expect an increase in flows of, of the rivers under uh, medium emission scenarios, the 4.5, and a reduction under a high emission scenarios. So it's important not only the target, the 1.5, because it's the same for, for the two analyses, but also it's important the pathway we follow to reach this target, this warming target. So now we are more in a pathway like this, if we continue the increase in, in the emissions of, of greenhouse gases, what we expect is that we will reach 1.5 somewhere between 2030 and 2052. And it seems that we'll pass this 1.5 target and, and the temperature will continue increasing. So what can we do with this? This is the ideal pathway, this is where we are, and maybe this is the most real pathway to have this increase in, in temperature in uh, an overshoot with temperatures that are larger than 1.5 to some extent or for some period, and after that, that we can cool in some way the planet to, to reach the, the 1.5 target. So the question is how to do this? How can we cool the planet? And this is where solar radiation management appears as a possible technology to, to produce this cooling of, of the planet. These are the different technologies that they were already mentioned by Paulo and, and Alan, that we can use to, to cool the, the planet. 
And this is the motivation for our project. We wanted to explore if this is in some way a possible pathway to reach uh, the Paris Agreement target. And these are the technologies that can be used to reach this, this target. What will happen in, in, in La Plata Basin region with this? So we use um, simulations that uh, were produced under this uh, coordinated experiment. We use this G4 experiment where sulfur is injected into the atmosphere. This is a pathway that can be expected, the RCP 4.5, this medium emission pathway. And this experiment considers the injection of sulfur in, in the atmosphere for 50 years, this amount of sulfur, five teragrams per year. During these 50 years, just at the end of the, of, of the 50 years to reach the same radiative forcing at the beginning if we consider this RCP 4.5. So the, the experiments we will show, I will show you, just compares the impacts of following this pathway and this pathway considers this injection of sulfur into the atmosphere. So some results that were already produced com uh, comparing these two scenarios uh, for precipitation, evaporation, precipitation minus evaporation and runoff, the different components of, of the water cycle, and comparing the G4 and the base scenario, the RCP 4.5 that we are considering. And what you can see is that the changes, the expected changes in, in the basin are not homogeneous. In some regions we can expect a reduction of precipitation and in other regions of, of the basin, an increase in precipitation is, is projected. And also there are changes that are inhomogeneous in, in evaporation, increase and decrease in, in different regions. And also changes in precipitation minus evaporation and runoff. And in terms of changes in flows related to these two scenarios and the comparison of them, you can see that the changes projected in South America and in particular in La Plata Basin in the mean flows are different along the, the basin. So for some rivers, maybe we can expect an increase in the flows and for other rivers, we can expect an, a decrease and also changes in the extreme flows, the high flows and the low flows. So the goals of our project are this. We want to assess the possible effects of SRM in, in the hydroclimate of La Plata Basin. We want to explore changes in temperature, precipitation, evaporation, runoff and river discharges, and also changes in extremes, both in climate experience, precipitation and temperature, and also in, in the discharges to explore changes in flood frequencies and, and duration of, of floods. So the process of, of this project is we need the climate simulations with these geoengineering techniques. We will use simulations from the GeoMIP G4 experiment I'd show you, and also from other uh, model that was developed at ENCAR, the name is GLENS. We need also to compare the simulations with observations. For this, we are using a database that was created some years ago under a European uh, program, project, the name of CLARIS, and also the WATCH. Um, database and the variables we are analyzing are daily precipitation, Tmax and, and Tmin. As uh, all climate models have systematic errors, we need to correct these errors and to do this we use a, a bias correction technique. We use this method, the ECMIP. ECMIP was a coordinated project to explore impacts of climate change on, on different uh, regions and different sectors. So we agreed to, to use this method to finally explore, explore the climate impacts of, of geoengineering. In, 
mean and extreme temperature precipitation. And to do this, we will use uh, a group of indices that were uh, used uh, in, in many studies to explore these changes in extremes. But, and to explore the hydrological impacts of, of this uh, geoengineering, we will use a hydrologic model. The name of, of this model is big. I, I will show you some details of, of the model uh, in the next slide. And we will explore changes in runoff, evapotranspiration, as I mentioned before, stream flow, and also changes in, in floods. This is the hydrologic model we are using. It was developed in the States uh, by the University of Washington some years ago. And it mainly calculates the energy and water balance in different, uh, in, in different uh, grid points in, in the basin with this uh, resolution you see here and at the daily time, time step. So these are the different points where we calculate this, this balance, this energy and water balance. And after that, we use a routing model just to uh, calculate the discharges at a closing point of, of the basin. The input data we need to run this hydrologic model are, are this. We need meteorological data, precipitation, Tmax and Tmin. We also need soil data information. We are considering this database. And we also need vegetation data and we are using uh, the University of Maryland's database on, on vegetation. And the output of, of the model is the stream flow at different closing points that you define in, in the basin at both daily and, and monthly um, time steps. And also, uh, we produce with the model these other uh, variables of, of the water balance, runoff and, and evapotranspiration. And for this project, we are considering all these closing points you see here. They are indicated with these triangles in, in, in this map. At the Paraguay River, at the Paraná River, and also at the Uruguay River and at the Iguazú River. Today, I will show only results at uh, Paraná River, Itaipú, and in the, for the Uruguay River at Salto Grande. These two locations are quite relevant in terms of hydroelectric um, production for, for La Plata Basin. So some of the results we already have in this project. This says uh, the annual precipitation in, in the basin. And this is the outputs of four uh, models, these uh, four geoengineering models. And this is how we get the precipitation after this bias correction process. As you can see, precipitation is quite different from observations as we can as we have it from, from as the outputs of, of the models. This is why need, we need to correct the, the precipitation before using it in the hydrologic model, just to, to remove the systematic errors of, of, the, of the climate models. And to do this, we use a calibration period, a 10 years calibration period, and a validation period, 1991, 2000. This is the comparison I'm showing here. So these are the stream flow changes we project that could happen in the basin when considering solar radiation management. And this is the shift 4 experiment, these orange changes. And the black ones are according to the RCP 4.5 scenario. For two time slices, one of these is 25 years for the near future and for the middle future to the end of uh, to the middle and, and to the end of, of the century for the Uruguay River at, at Salto Grande at this point for two of the models we are considering 
And what we can see is that in all cases, we expect a reduction in the flows of the Uruguay River at Salto Grande, where we have this hydroelectric plant that is quite relevant for energy production, both for Argentina and Uruguay. It's a shared, uh, it's a shared uh, hydroelectric plant. And the reduction in the stream flow in the case of this uh, model is uh, larger for the geoengineering scenario than for the RCP 4.5. And for this model, it also is larger the, the reduction in, in the mainstream flow in the G4 scenario for the near period, but it changes the sign, uh, not the sign, but it changes the, the relation is larger for the RCP 4.5 than for the G4 scenario. And in the case of the Paraná River at Itaipu, also relevant, as I mentioned before, for the hydroelectric production in, in the basin. In the case of this model, we have different signs in the projections. The G4 scenario projects an increase in the flows of the Paraná River, but the RCP 0.45 shows a decrease in the flows <coughs> And for the middle future, there's a decrease for both scenarios. And in the case of the MIROC model, we also found a decrease in the, in the flows in all cases that are larger for the RCP 4.5 than in the G4 scenario. So if we can to if we try to understand why we have these changes in the flows in, in the basin, these are the changes for this model for the Uruguay River and for the Paraná River. And this is the changes we can expect under the G4 experiment. And this is we found a reduction in precipitation for all of for all this region. This is why we expect a reduction in, in the flows, this, these two reductions in, in the flows, and also an increase in, uh, in, in temperature. And if we compare these results for, the, for this, uh, the same model, but under the RCP 4.5, what we see is that the changes in, in precipitation are lower than compared to the geoengineering uh, experiment. That's why the reduction here is not so large, because it's mostly related to a large increase in temperature that maybe produces large uh, evaporation in the basin. That's we have this reduction in, in the flows. So if we compare again for the same model, the projections between the G4 experiment with geoengineering or the R with the RCP 4.5, what we can see that uh, the geoengineering leads to a reduction in, in precipitation in this region. Mostly this affects the Uruguay basin. This is because we have this large reduction here. And the situation of, of the Paraná River is slightly different. We have an increase here, and this is mostly related because we have an increase here in precipitation where we have the Guazú River that tributes water to the Paraná River. That's why we have this increase in, in the flows. And in the case of the MIROC model, where we have this reduction both for the Uruguay and the Paraná River and for all scenarios, this uh, reduction is again related to a slight decrease in precipitation in this region, but also an increase, a large increase in, in temperature that it's related to an increase in evaporation. And this is why we have this reduction in, in the flows probably. If we compare with the RCP scenarios, this is what, what happens. We have an increase in precipitation in, in this region, but this reduction is mostly associated to this extreme warming of, of the basin under this scenario that, again, is related 
probably with an increase in evapotranspiration. And finally, if we compare the RCP 4.5 with the G4 scenario, just to understand the difference between these projections in, in the flows, what we find is that this can be in some way explained because we have um, here a positive uh, sign for this model in precipitation. This means that under the shift 4 scenario, under this geoengineering scenario, we have an increase in, in precipitation in the basin compared with the RCP 4.5. And we also have an, a, a cooler uh, situation in, in the basin. So this also leads to, to different changes in, in evaporation. <coughs> In, in the basin. So we have, this is the, again the summary of the results we have for the Uruguay River for two models and for the Parana River for two models. We mostly find a reduction of flows in, in the basin. We need to explore some other models just to, to have an ensemble of, of the results and to, to assess the uncertainties in, we have also in these projections. But at least what we are um, finding is that we can expect a, a reduction of the flows in the Uruguay River, at least for these two models. These reductions are quite extreme for this, uh, for this model, larger for, than for this one. And the changes in the Paraná River also are, are related to lower flows in, in most of the cases. The only exception is here that is related to an increase in the flows of the Iguazu River. But well, these are the preliminary results we are having. We are planning to work with most with more uh, geoengineering uh, experiments and, and models, and also with the other uh, set of, of models, the, the, uh, the set of outputs of the GLENS model. We have an, a year and a half ahead to finish this, this project. So thank you. Gracias. Uh, Perguntas, questões, colocações, por favor. Acho que é mais fácil você pegar o microfone aqui. Hi, professor. My name is Celina. I'm civil engineer. I'm doing the master in Institute of Energy and Environment. And I'm working with a model in oceanography in the coast of Santos, uh, where we have some increasing in the level of the water. And it's very important for us the data of the discharge of rivers. And we have only data based on uh, measures of the past. And I would like to know if you are the plan to expand your, your project to our basin, because it's, it's very cool. Not yet, because uh, it was prop the proposal is related to, to La Plata Basin, and I think this is uh, one of, of the, birth, uh, the first projects to, to explore the impacts of geoengineering in, in South America. But I think that after that, uh, I don't know if my group, but maybe others can, can start to, to explore the, the impacts of, of these technologies in different basins and, and regions, but not for us, uh, at least for, for the next year, we, we, we have to work hard still with, with lab. Okay, thank you. I think it, it would be interesting if you could say a few words about uh, how you got involved in this project, um, the funding for this project. It would be useful for some people here, I think. Well, I got involved in, in the project because I've been involved as, as an author in the IPCC, in the AR5, and also in the S1.5 um, report. And geoengineering and solar radiation management, management was also always an issue in the discussion of, of the IPCC. 
uh, that maybe is not reflected in the written reports, but it, it's very present in the discussions when we, in the process of, of creating this, the reports. And uh, I, I also have been invited some years ago to a geoengineering um, workshop that it was in the National Academy of Sciences. And this was for me the, the first time to listen about that. And after that, I, I, I think it was last year, I, I knew that there was a, a funding, a new funding to explore impacts uh, for developing countries of solar radiation management. So I think that was a good opportunity to, to start working on, on that under this coordinated uh, program that uh, helps to compare the impacts of, on different developing countries of, of solar radiation management on different issues. Some of us, I think uh, Andy will explain this tomorrow. There are eight projects working around the, the world, but all of them in developing countries, but to explore impacts of solar radiation management, some of, of them are involved in hydrological impacts, some others in, in different uh, issues. And we have been working for a long time on climate change impacts in, in La Plata Basin, so I wanted to, to know this technology, what will will produce. So the, the funding will explain uh, I think better by, by Andy later today or, or tomorrow. Okay, thank you very much. We'll have to go for the next talk that will be given by Frank Kelch from Harvard University. And Frank will uh, present a very risk experiment on a very risk business on injecting aerosols in the stratosphere. Um. Um, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be able to present this research um, to you. I will say that I actually think the experiment itself is not risky, but what it stands for, uh, there's a lot of risk associated with what it stands for. And so what I want to give you first is a perspective. I am mainly an experimentalist. What I do overall in um, atmospheric science and atmospheric uh, chemistry is that uh, working on the observational side, we've heard a lot about models and uh, we need these models to give predictions of us of different parameters we're interested in, like the atmospheric circulation, we heard about the hydrological cycle, we want to know about stratospheric ozone, temperature, extreme events, all these things. Now, to gain trust in these models, we very often hinge on having observations that give us some trust in this. So one of the very important things are, for example, field observations, where we take a model, we compare what the model says, and see what the world actually looks like. So these field observations are critical for us to actually have an understanding of this. When we see a discrepancy between models and field observations, we go back, for example, to the laboratory or to fundamental physics to try and understand what processes may not be correct in the model. We do studies either in the lab or physics studies or uh, of various kinds or some field ecological studies, and then we try to improve processes in the model. And so in my view, one of the really critical questions for this, what I will be talking about, the stratospheric geoengineering, is if we want to know how good models are, what are observations that we need, what are observations that we can get, that allow us to actually evaluate the, how good the models work. And so that's what I'll sort of talk to you about. Then from an observational perspective, I will go into why I th what we can do on this side to uh, inform models, to get better outcomes. I will however start, and before I get into that, I will give you my very personal reason why I started getting into this research. And what I'm this is a largely a summary of what we've already heard about. What I will be talking about is stratospheric Radiation management, the idea of bringing reflective aerosols into the stratosphere. It is clear that that will cool down the planet. There is less sunlight coming down. And one of the things I'll say about it, and uh, Alan already talked quite a bit about what it means, is the fact that it, this is fast and cheap relative to changing a whole energy infrastructure, at least doing it. Who knows what the cost of side effects would be. It is also imperfect, highly uncertain, and one of the big things that's been said is, so I don't have to repeat it that much, it actually doesn't address the cause, it only addresses symptoms. And so, for example, I can tell you that I always compare stratospheric geoengineering to a broad audience and say, these are like 
opioids, like very strong painkillers that address a symptom, but they don't address the cause. And so one ha you know, in many ways, I think there are a lot of parallels in that way. I will talk about this. Here's my thinking about the motivation to actually do research in something that doesn't fix the problem. And this, in many ways, reflects what's been said. Here is what the IPCC report says. We need to, half, to stay below 1.5 degrees Celsius. We need to have CO2 emissions by 2030. And by 2050, we want to be CO2 neutral. And then you say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Perhaps we can do this. If we look at what we're doing right now, this is already out there. We are emitting about 40 gigatons of CO2 per year at the moment, close to that. And here you can choose different countries and how much they do. And I have to say, I live in the US, and I am from Germany. And compared to all these other countries, that makes me um, feel not so great about myself, because um, we are causing a lot of these emissions. Here's another table, not from the one and a half degree report, but this is a table from the previous report from the IPCC. And what that, that shows is, whoops, I pressed the wrong button here. I don't know what to do now. Oh, I did it again. Start again. All right. Sorry. If only I knew something about technology. Um, all right. So um, this table here, what you see is from the IPCC, if you want to have a two-thirds chance of staying below one and a half degrees Celsius, there are 400 gigatons of CO2 left to emit until we have our integrated emissions are the level where we're going to reach one and a half degrees Celsius. This was in 2011. So this actually table implies that 400 gigatons of CO2 divided by 40 gigatons per year, that there's roughly 10 years left to actually that we can emit CO2 at the rate we are in 2011. That actually means that this table says we're not half in 2030 or zero in 2050 based on emissions. We have to be zero in 2021 or 2022. That is never going to happen. So the chance for that the way this is represented here is zero, right? It is never going to happen. And well, how can the IPCC then say these previous reports? And that is the best illustration of that is this table that Polo also show, showed. It is, here's our scenario. And what they use is a large degree of this BEX, bioenergy carbon capture storage. You grow a tree, you burn a tree. Well, could be something else in a tree. You grow biomass, you burn biomass. That gives you energy, and you also, the CO2 that comes out, you store underground. We don't really know how to do this yet, yet in these models, hey, look at this emission scenario. In 2020, this is, twen this is next year, right? This is what the emissions, the gray are our CO2 emissions. This is what they start doing. Again, I think this is pure utopia. I think actually the only, the most re reasonable one is this one over here. I think, I hope we do better, but between these two, even here, it starts dropping in 2020. Again, I think this seems very unlikely. And even in this one, where you drop in 2020 very quickly, the land use area you have to use for BEX in 2050, this is in 2050, so only 30 years away, is the size of India. Where is this land that we can use for this? I think this is actually, to me, this is when I saw this, this was my main reason that I thought this sounds really, really hard. I'm not saying we can't do it. And also the idea that you can do this without severe impacts on how societies live, I think is also not reasonable. We have to have dramatic changes. Given this, if we think we want to stay below one and a half degrees Celsius, you really start talking about solar radiation management and this idea at least that one could cool down the planet to give us time to actually perhaps have something more like this scenario and find ways of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So my motivation is that I'm really worried because what's going to happen is if in 2030 or 2040 there's a climate crisis, what I worry about personally, if the population start demanding a fast action and tell politicians you have to do something now, right? They can say something they'll do fast, but the only thing, nearly the only thing that you can do that actually is fast acting is cool, you know, is doing radiation management, relatively speaking. Because taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, we have all this integrated CO2, it takes a long time. You can't get that you know, cooling very quickly by taking CO2 out, it would have to be on huge scales. That's my personal perspective, I'm not saying it's right. But then when I saw these things, that's what motivated me to say, I don't want to get in a situation where politicians suddenly just say, oh, we know what we can do if people protest and start doing this. And coming from Germany, one reason I've seen why people change their opinions quickly is that 
the German government was all in favor of nuclear power because that was good for their climate goals, and then Fukushima happened in Japan, and the Germans went on the road and said, we don't want nuclear power, and from one day to the next, the German government changed direction, 180 degrees, and said, we're going to get out of nuclear power. So politicians, I think, will make decisions based on, they'll make them anyway, and what I think I want to do is try to provide as many facts about stratospheric geoengineering as we can until then. Not saying that we should do this. I'm not saying we should do this. But I think we should know more about the risks of this. So what do we know about this? Uh, you know, how could you deploy this? This has already been said in many ways. You know, you can try to stay. So this is climate risk, and here's time. I have it without an axis, as Alan complained, is quite often. Um, so you can use it to try and stay. If this is fossil fuels forever, that's terrible. If we cut emissions to zero, the climate risk sort of level off at some high level. We can try using carbon removal to get back down, but we'd, while we're doing that, as it's slow, we could use solar geoengineering to perhaps stay away from a tipping point. And one thing you can also do is that a lot of risks are related to the rate of change. If change is fast, it's hard for adaptation for ecosystems to adapt. If you can slow down the rate of change, then that may be useful as well. But fundamentally, I want to make clear that you know we do need mitigation and uh, absolutely, and that this stratospheric, it is not a solution, right? Remember, it's a painkiller. It doesn't actually solve the problem. It can perhaps reduce suffering, but it will not fix the problem. Um, I'll skip this because that's hydrological cycle, and uh, Ines just gave a very nice um, talk about this. I I'm putting this slide up here. This is more a primer for tomorrow's discussions about governance. I want to make clear that I'm a physical scientist, so I feel more uh, skilled at talking about the physical side, but I am aware, you know, I think these things we have to think about is that there are many risks entailed with this to have to do with governance and moral hazard and a lot of aspects, you know, as Alan said, who controls the thermostat, all these questions uh, are very important. But I want to point out that there is this risk down here that solar geoengineering may be viewed as the only fast method to actually do something about climate impacts. And for that reason, I think we should be doing research about this. And I want to say I'm very aware, I'll get at the end, I'll actually talk more about governance on our project. So what do we actually know about risks from stratospheric aerosol injection? There is quite a few things we already know. We've had volcanic eruptions. Mount Pinatubo is usually used as the one that injected about 10 million tons of sulfur into the stratosphere. By the way, what you see here is the ash. That didn't really make it into the stratosphere. What happens is SO2 gas, sulfur dioxide, go, makes it into the stratosphere. It gets oxidized to sulfuric acid, very strong acid. That then forms little particles, and these particles reflect back sunlight. Right? That, so that's the cooling effect. But we also know that it destroys ozone. What you see here is an annual sort of per month, and here is the total amount of ozone in Dobson units. And what you see here in this blue range, that's sort of the average ozone in the stratosphere, the variability before Mount Pinatubo, and here you see two years after Mount Pinatubo, and there was actually another volcano that also contributed to this. But you can see ozone is destroyed in the stratosphere. We've been trying to do a lot to actually save the ozone in the stratosphere with the Montreal Protocol and follow on. So this is a large first order impact that if you have sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, it destroys the ozone. We actually understand the chemistry and physics of this quite well. A second impact, this is actually a paper by Alan. Um, what you see is stratospheric temperature. And you can see there were two volcanic eruptions. These are years from 1979 to 2000. You can see here a strong increase in temperature. This general trend comes from climate change, by the way. As it gets warmer down here, the stratosphere cools down. You see a general trend in cooling. And then you see the volcanic eruptions on top of that. Mount Pinatubo, a very significant heating of the stratosphere. That we understand why it heats up. It has to do with the molecular properties of sulfuric acid. That's clear. But what this does, we don't know so well. Whereas, what, you know, because what you're doing when you're heating up the stratosphere, you start changing stratospheric circulation. That couples to the troposphere and can do all kinds of things. So this is a big concern. And another important first order impact that happens with the sulfuric acid. Here a picture where you don't have to understand the details, but what I will say is that what you see here is from a model by Aquila in 2014, where they put aerosol, you have a control, this is sort of their normal atmosphere without geoengineering, 
And then they either put, it could be a volcanic eruption or geoengineering, it doesn't really matter. You put aerosols at about 16 to 25 kilometers in the stratosphere to reduce sunlight. And then what you see here is actually the zonal wind. It's called the quasi-biennial biennial oscillation, where at the equator, the wind direction sort of changes roughly every two years, and that sort of propagates down from high in the stratosphere to low. And the main thing to see is that this changes, and in this scenario over here, where you inject it higher, it actually collapses. So now you're actually, by doing this in this model, you are actually getting rid of one of the currently dominant meteorological patterns in the stratosphere. What impacts that has is a good question, but you're really changing the system, and you know, who knows what the downstream consequences are. In fact, for stratospheric geos, for this, there's a lot of need for science that has to do with the injection of stratospheric aerosols. That is just general science we need to know about the stratosphere. Here's a long list, you don't need to look at all of these, but there are lots of things that stratospheric scientists are trying to understand about the stratosphere that we also need for geoengineering. They want to understand better the dynamics. For example, climate models predict that the stratosphere should move faster as, a, as climate change occurs. Observations have not really shown that. Is that because we don't have the right observations? Is it because the models are wrong? We actually don't really know at the moment. There are lots of questions, and one, I'm gonna focus on two which we will, are trying to address with the experiment I'll talk about soon. So there's one is, for example, the stratospheric sulfur budget is an important question. I'll point something out about that. And there's also this question of fine-scale processes. One of the questions in the stratosphere is how do aerosols actually evolve over time? And a lot of that, what's important for that is sort of small turbulence because that can bring particles together. So there's a lot of questions. And I actually want to point out that if we want to think about stratospheric Geoengineering, there's a lot of questions we need to answer anyway to understand what even climate change will do to the stratosphere and circulation. What I want to show is some uncertainties I actually think are quite remarkable that have come out over the last years. And one is just the stratospheric sulfur budget. This is the question, if we want to perturb a system, should we really understand the system we are perturbing? That means the background stratosphere. And I would say before you actually change a system, you really should understand that system well. And it turns out that we actually don't, oh, I did it again. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no clumsy fingers. Um, all right, here we go. So one of the things is actually that the amount of sulfur that goes into the stratosphere varies a lot depending on when you look at in situ, that means you look with a plane how much sulfur you're seeing going into the stratosphere. Here's from satellites and models. There's the more than order of magnitude difference between these. What's the right answer? We don't know. Then we, but we actually know how much sulfur is there, but this is how much sulfur gets into it. There's a large variation in this. So we actually don't even really understand the budget for the background stratospheric aerosol that well. We understand it fairly well, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. What is the source of sulfur, for example, at the moment? Another thing I want to show, point out is that until recently, I would say that all stratospheric scientists thought that the aerosol in the stratosphere at the moment was this sulfuric acid aerosol. It turns out, this is a complicated figure, but here is the, the fraction of particles and what it contains of. So pure sulfuric acid is actually this red line over here. And you can actually see that the red line is, is never the dominant fraction of the aerosol in the stratosphere. So what we thought it was, the, uh, this idea that it's pure sulfuric acid aerosol at middle latitudes is actually never true. When you lower down, it all contains a lot of organic material that we don't understand how it gets there, how does it live. Another thing we don't, and if you go high up, you ha have a lot of meteoritic iron. So this is from meteors coming down, evaporating an iron, then recondenses and you get it in there. In fact, one estimate says that 30 to 40% of the non-volcanic aerosol scattering, that means how much it's sort of scattering in sunlight back at the moment, comes from organics. This, I, I virtually guarantee this is a no model. So the main point of this slide is there's lots of uncertainties about stratospheric aerosol that we need to answer before we actually think about doing stratospheric geoengineering. And by the way, I'm also doing experiments for that. So I'm not only doing the experiment, I'll talk to you about it then. One thing we also don't understand well is actually this idea of the scattering of uh, of, of turbulence in the stratosphere. Now I want to get what we can do with experiments. So I'll get towards the experiment we want to do. In the end, we want to do an experiment in the, in the stratosphere, but I want to motivate why we want to do this. All right? 
So the idea is what can we actually think about here? Well, we know that the reason sulfuric acid aer uh, aerosol destroys ozone and raises the temperature has to do with its molecular properties. So as a chemist, I then think, well, are there other materials that don't have these very large first order impacts that don't heat the stratosphere and don't destroy ozone? Because if your first order impact is smaller, it stands to reason that all the downstream effects will be smaller as well. So this is the question I set out to answer. And of course, you have to think about all the downstream effects as well. What happens when it comes down in the troposphere? Do humans inhale material? What does it do to ecosystems? But I'm starting in the stratosphere with the question, are there different materials? So one material, and sorry for the formula, I was in transfer. So we actually, I actually looked at the chemical properties, the physical properties of a material, and it actually turns out that one material that to me seems like a very, very good material, and to my colleagues, is limestone, calcium carbonate. It is fundamentally a fairly harmless substance. It is very common in the environment. There's lots of mineral dust that's windblown. That doesn't necessarily mean that if you inhale small particles that it's good for your lungs. So we're actually working with the School of Public Health at Harvard about this. And one of the things that, that's nice, it has near ideal optical properties. What you see here is in a model result, is in some model of uh, geoengineering, if you introduce different materials, how much does a, a troposphere, the stratosphere heat up? This is about 20 kilometers up here. And you can see if you put in sulfate, you get this heating of the stratosphere by quite a bit. Rutile has been, uh, titanium dioxide has been suggested by people, which I think is a terrible idea for various reasons. And you can see the calcite actually has virtually no impact on this. So from an optical perspective, it seems like a great material. You're not going to heat up the stratosphere. So that sounds great. What about the chemistry? Well, one of the things is that calcium carbonate, limestone, is a base. So when this actually interacts with the sulfuric acid that exists in the stratosphere, what's going to happen is it'll actually neutralize this acid. And it is these acidic surfaces that drive ozone-destroying chemistry. So it certainly will not do that chemistry, right? So you're not going to have that ozone-destroying chemistry that you have with sulfuric acid. But one of the problems is here, sort of, that shows you some of the chemical reactions. In essence, you neutralize your calcium carbonate and turn it into these complicated particles. The big problem with this is this material does not exist naturally in the stratosphere. So we actually, I can guarantee you, it won't do the same thing as sulfuric acid, but we don't know what it will do. All right? And so it could be that it's much worse for th reasons. So we need to study this. So we do laboratory studies where we first, the same way, exactly the same kind of studies that were done with Molina in the lab, we do with this material. We can find some results of that. We put this in a model. You know, now we're going from our laboratory to this model study. And what we find is that if we compare the amount of ozone column in 2040 and compare it to pre-industrial conditions, before we had CFCs and these things, you can see that without geoengineering in 2040, we still have significant ozone loss, especially over Antarctica in, in the winter. You can see these very low values. These red values are still negative here, just to be clear. So without geoengineering, you see a lot of ozone loss. It actually turns out with this material in the model, based on our laboratory results, you can actually see there's a lot less ozone loss. In fact, in some areas, you get an ozone gain towards compared to pre-industrial. That's based on the laboratory studies. Now, one of the problems is we have these laboratory studies. We have a new material that does not exist naturally in the stratosphere. We put it into a model, and that looks great. Now, if I ask you guys whether you think that because this guy did some lab studies and they look great, we should do this, I hope you would say, well, I'm not sure how much I trust that he did these experiments right. How do we know that these laboratory studies we're doing actually reflect the real complex stratospheric system. There could be things we, d we don't know about. We actually could have just simply done the experiments wrong. So there's a lot of questions you have to ask about whether these results are correct. And so what we usually do, and what has done, what I'll say with the, with the Montreal Protocol for ozone, I think one of the reasons that was so successful is that there were laboratory studies, there were models that said CFCs, these chlorofluorocarbons, in the end result in ozone destruction. Right? But without flights and measurements that actually showed that what these models predicted, these things, were really observed in the atmosphere, right? I don't think you could have convinced people very easily that this was really the case. So now the problem is with this calcium carbonate, we want to do the same thing. We want to observe this in the field, but it doesn't exist naturally in the atmosphere. So the only way we can test this is actually by putting some calcium carbonate into the stratosphere. 
And so this is now where I talk about last part, and I'll sum up very fairly quickly. So what we are planning is to do the what we call the stratospheric controlled perturbation experiment. The idea here, this is not really a geoengineering experiment. We're not trying to change the radiative balance of anything. What we're trying to understand with this experiment is whether these laboratory results we had match. And we actually want to do, do two things with this experiment. So first, we want to improve understanding of some aspects of the efficacy and risk of solar geoengineering, for example, with this calcium carbonate material. We also want to actually understand some other aspects of the stratosphere that are very important better. Small-scale turbulence, the thing that will bring particles together, and in the end will tell you how quickly they grow how big. It's very important, because if they all collide with each other and become big, they just fall out. If they stay individual, they live longer, and these are very important parameters generally. The other thing we actually want to do is we actually want to do this trying to show good governance. And what I mean with that is that we want to conduct the experiment in a way where we can sort of set up a way perhaps for future experiments of other people of how one can do this. Hopefully we don't want to be an example of how not to do this. And I can tell you as a physical scientist, this down here is something very challenging and I'll tell you how we deal with this in the end. This is what the experiment will look like, and we're currently building this up, so we've done a lot of modeling, and we're actually building the physical parts for this to go together. So the idea is that you have a stratospheric balloon, which actually in the stratosphere doesn't look like this anymore, it's rounder, um, at about 20 kilometers above ground in the stratosphere, and below that you have what we call an equipment gondola. This equipment gondola has propellers on it, and the balloon then sort of flies along and makes a plume of a material that we want to study behind it, and then we turn the balloon around, and we sort of fly back through this and see whether the chemical model we've developed of what should happen to the air and the aerosol matches with observations. So what we're trying to test are these small-scale processes. This gives you an idea of, of, you know, we're gonna make a plume that's perhaps a kilometer long, we're gonna inject something like 500 grams of material into the stratosphere. So again, the actual risk of the experiment is virtually zero. Those 500 grams of material that we put in the stratosphere will have no impact on the ground, right? A normal airplane flight, just a thousand kilometers, puts a lot more particles into the atmosphere than we're doing here. Nonetheless, this of course ha is of great symbolic value because we're sort of putting a balloon up there that is putting material in the stratosphere. So from, from a governance perspective, this has very large implications. Here are just some of the scientific questions we want to answer. We first want to actually, just to make clear, nobody has done this before, so we actually first, just building this balloon and testing it is a challenge. Does the balloon really fly the way we think? So there's engineering questions. We actually want to test models of small-scale stratospheric mixing. This is very important for actually understanding where turbulence in the stratosphere occurs, which is currently not well understood. And we also, one of our first tests would be to try and understand this calcium carbonate aerosol. The outcome of that then will give us more faith in the representation just of these things in models. All these other complicated aspects of the models, the impact on the hydrological cycle, all those things, this experiment directly does not help, right? It won't make any difference for that. Um, and so we're trying to overlap with Spark and other objectives. So I finish up by just talking about governance very briefly. So to do this experiment so that we do this in a way that hopefully can be an example for geoengineering, other geoengineering experiments. We sort of decided on a concept that really hinges on an advisor committee. So there are a lot of different things we have to fulfill before we can do the experiment. We have to have the technology ready. Are we actually doing good science? Have we looked at health and safety? Are there legal issues? Is there something we're missing here? A lot of these are fairly direct yes or no answers, right? We can sort of know they're right or they're wrong. And for a number of them, either I can answer them myself or I can talk to colleagues and there can be a new process to look at these. The further you go right, the, the further goes away from my perspective and I will need help for this. I'm not a legal expert. And then there's actually this big question of what people call legitimacy. You know, are we ready from a governance perspective to do this experiment? That one really is way outside of my area of expertise. And for that one, I need advice from an advisory committee. And so this advisory committee, which is independent, what that will do is actually have oversight and will give advice and evaluation of what we're doing. So the answer, whether the tick mark comes here, will actually come from the advisory committee, not from me. 
And so when the advisory committee, for example, says, you know, all of these things are right, but you know, you need to do more stakeholder engagement or something like this, then before we actually do the experiment, we'll have to answer them in a public way and say, okay, you know, point A and B are fine, point C, we're going to do this. Is the advisory committee happy with this? And so we're going to proceed from that because there are a lot of questions that I don't really feel fit of answering myself. And so, and I can tell you this has been a very complicated process for me, but we're finally there here, experiment team, this is where I am. And this is the way we're set up, is that the Dean and Vice Provost of Research uh, uh, got an independent search committee, the search committee selected a chair, then there'll be an independent advisory committee, and there'll be back and forth between all this sort of experiment team, the advisory committee, mediated by the Dean and Vice Provost of Research, who are my bosses at the university, and one of the ideas is they will also tell us how to engage with stakeholders. And so this is a system we're setting up that is the best we could come up with. And fundamentally what's going to happen is that we will only go forward after the Independent Advisory Committee has sort of approved in the end what we think we want to do. And this is because at the moment there really is no external. It would be great if the UN or somebody in the United States actually had something that we could talk to and say, are we ready to go this? This does not exist. Even just for an experiment that has no impact, what, no physical impact. And I'll stop there and just put up that there's a whole team involved. It's not just one person. Especially uh, David Keith is really one of the uh, drivers of, of a lot of the solar changing research happening at Harvard. Ok, uh, questões? Uma aqui já fica fácil com o microfone. I saw in one of your slides, I saw in one of your slides organic sulfate. What do you mean by organic sulfate? Is dimethyl sulfite something that the biosphere produces? This is what you mean by organic. I'm sorry because I'm not a chemist. Um, No, that is a, that's actually a very good question. What this means is that these particles in the stratosphere, the only thing we know at the moment is that they consist both of organic molecules and of sulfate. We actually don't know in which form they exist there. Clearly, the organic part has come from the troposphere. But we act, and it stands to the reason that a significant amount of it is, comes from plant emissions. But we actually really don't know at the moment what this organic uh, molecules come from. As you see, the, the, the ocean is 70% of the, of, the, of the Earth, and the ocean produces billions of dimethyl sulfite for phytoplankton. So perhaps that uh, lower half of the atmosphere that you saw that there is a dominance of organic sulfate perhaps can come from, from the ocean, oceans. So what I can say, there is, a, there is a chance it comes from the oceans, but when you look at the reactive carbon that makes organic aerosol usually, it is mainly from land-based vegetation. So we have lots of questions. Please be brief on your yeah. questions, otherwise, yeah, go ahead. É, em agosto de 2018, o general Hamilton Mourão, durante uma palestra de campanha, e falando em relação a mudanças climáticas, ele deu um alerta para todo o público de que, para nos prepararmos, que estaríamos entrando nas guerras climáticas, e, e inclusive que avisou os subordinados que mataríamos e morreríamos pelo clima. E nada mais foi falado, nós já estamos em junho de 2019, ele é vice-presidente da República, a geoengenharia climática não poderia ser utilizada nesse sistema de guerra climática, já que nada é esclarecido, porque ah, as explicações científicas aqui são excelentes, porém, o que é isso pode estar sendo usado militarmente, nós não temos acesso. Não temos informações. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the very beginning. It, the question was, can this be used in a military way? Yeah. So what I would say is that for the stratospheric geoengineering, it's a global effect. And so if, I'm not saying it can't be done because military can be very inventive. But fundamentally, because it is a global effect, it's very hard to target anything specific. So one of the disadvantages of the stratospheric changing being a global effect is that it's sort of hard to optimize regionally what you, the effects. But one of the advantages is that I think it does make it a little harder to do something where I could say, you know, I'm going to control your climate specifically and not everything else. 
but I think it is a it is a concern and it's a complicated question. But that's what I would think. And yes. Thank you, Frank. Frank, in your talk, you spoke of the advisory committee as providing the legitimacy to be able to undertake the project. But that advisory committee is not answerable or under any global framework, which you also mentioned, because there's no global regulation. So where would that legitimacy come from? What, what I, my answer to that, it is our best attempt of trying to get more legitimacy, right? I mean, to me, one of the problems with legitimacy is I don't think that's a simple yes or no, like, are we technologically ready? It's sort of, what have you done to go towards this? And what, the only thing I can say is it is the best idea we could come up with to have something independent. And on that advisory committee, there will be, be you know, there will be, I don't have influence on that because it's independent. But my, I, I, I'm pretty sure there'll be people from NGOs that are quite critical from geoengineering and other people and things like that. But that's the only thing we could think of. And if somebody has an idea of what we could do better, I would be, I would very much like to hear, to hear about it. I, yeah, I agree. It's not, yeah. Could you tell a little more about in, at what stage are you in building up the, the advisory committee? It's a very interesting idea. I mean, so how, yeah. how I mean, what are the, right. the what is the, the, the receptivity in the scientific community? What obstacles, what criticism? That's a good question. I can't answer all of those because I'm not the rest of the scientific community and I don't know whether they tell me directly what they think. What I can say is that we, I was hoping I would be able to announce the advisory committee chair, and there's actually a vice chair we're gonna have, and they have agreed to this, and I think it'll be announced within the next week or so, we'll actually will have our advisory committee chair, the vice chair, and at least part of that committee announced. So that's the stage this is at. I can say that this took a long time. This has been a process of, I think, one and a half years or so to do this because the people doing this want to have time to really think about what it is. So that's where we are. I actually don't, I mean, to ask the, how the scientific community res, looks at this, it may be better to ask people like uh, Alan, as he's the part of the rest of the scientific community. I don't quite know what they think. And again, what I can say, it's really the, the best we could come up with. And I don't know, do we want to have Alan give a brief answer to that? <laughs> the, the, you don't even have to do this, have an external advisory committee. You could just go do it, with, the, and there are no regulations to stop you unless you're, the amount you're emitting is less than required for an environmental impact statement for, by EPA, even if you do it in the United States. So I think what you're doing is research on advice, on advisory committees. I hope you publish a paper about that too, not just about the science, because it's, it's something new. And so I think it's great that you're doing this. At the same time, in parallel, there should be international governance going on through the United Nations WMO or something like that. Other people in the room know more about this than I do. But it's good that you're actually doing this in the first place. But because you're doing it, even though you can't choose a committee, your dean is involved, so you're not completely divorced from it either. So, so we'll see how it goes. It will be a nice experiment. Okay, let's uh, assume that uh, this idea of spraying with uh, CaCO3 limestone is uh, feasible. Uh, do you have, from the modeling point of view, an idea of uh, how much limestone, for instance, is necessary uh, to have a significant impact compared to the global production of limestone for mostly for agricultural uh, uh, activities? Yes, so the first answer I give is that there is enough limestone I'm producing, so mining limestone would be, I think, not problematic. Where it gets more complicated and this is that the, the limestone you have has to be pure calcium carbonate. If there's like a little bit of a trace of iron in it, it'll suddenly become absorbing. So actually, I think in the end, this would have to be something like a manufactured limestone. In the right, you can already buy it in the right size. What I say, and this may sound like a little bit of, that I'm trying to not to answer, is that I really think, I'm more at the stage where I think we need to do the research to even understand some of these things. Humanity, if they have to find a solution, 
engineers can be amazing at finding ways. Look at our iPhones, right? The things we can do if there's a need and a, lo and a large enough market. I am sure we could get enough calcium carbonate together to do this in the right way. But my point at the moment is I actually don't like focusing too much on the cost of these things because it, the cheaper you make it, I actually don't think that's a good thing because it makes it even more appealing than it should be. I don't know whether that was really an answer. Uh, as, as far as I can see, I think y your experiment is facing exactly the same problems, criticisms and logistic aspects and commercial uh, effectiveness as the oceanographers. There were 25 years ago when they start to fertilize the ocean with iron. So it's, it's a very interesting parallel. So I hope you success. <laughs> Eu vejo que, é, em todos esses estudos, de uma forma geral, todos os grandes cientistas, todo mundo, todos os que tratam desses estudos, não estão levando em conta as leis da química. Ou seja, é, o peso molecular é fundamental para o entendimento disso. Ou seja, é, o gás carbônico ele tem um peso maior do que o oxigênio que nós respiramos. Se toda essa gigantesca é, produção de gás carbônico estivesse ainda no ar, ela simplesmente é, deslocaria o oxigênio e estaria todo mundo sufocado. Ou seja, o que, que ocorre? É que o gás carbônico ele é grandemente, principalmente, absorvido pelas águas, lagos, lagoas, mares e oceanos, e é por isso que nós estamos conseguindo respirar. Então, é, nesses estudos, são, são necessários usar então, é, o peso molecular, ou seja, gases leves, tais como o metano, esses sim sobem e lá em cima acabam é, entrando em contato com moléculas instáveis, tais como o ozônio. E, e de uma forma geral, é, e ele pode ficar algum, algum tempo lá em cima. Mas é, o que eu quero dizer é que, para efeito de laboratório, do seu, nos seus trabalhos, deve ser colocado dentro do, do ambiente de um laboratório completamente fechado, todo esses, todos esses gases envolvidos nesses estudos, para, ao final de um certo tempo, ou seja, injetar todos esses gases dentro desse ambiente, para, ao final de um certo tempo, fazer a observação e verificar onde estão esses gases, quais os que estão lá em cima e quais os que, os que foram absorvidos, evidentemente que tem que ter um nível de água para a absorção do gás carbônico. Então, para facilitar esses estudos, eu sugiro isso, levar em conta o peso molecular, está bem? Uh. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure I, I fully understood the question, but I do think that, um, what? Yeah, as I, yeah, I mean, I think the mixing of, at, of molecules in the atmosphere is, you know, in the models is considered. Um, and, and just to make clear again that well, these things would actually do nothing about reducing CO2, so if that was the concern, you know, these, mo these aerosols in the stratosphere will not do anything about CO2 in the atmosphere. They're not going to reduce CO2. Right, and actually, as it's cooler, you also need to use less energy. The second-order effects of doing this, like cooling the ocean more gets taken up, and you know, also the fact that you need to less, use less air conditioning. There are second-order effects on this, they're, but they're small effects. So for the actual CO2, if you think about the amount of CO2 in that, we have a problem with that. They, they, they really are not effective for that. But I'm not quite sure whether that was yeah. the question. Uh, I, I will answer in Portuguese. Uh, a segunda parte da sua pergunta significa o seguinte, será que dá para fazer esses experimentos é, fazendo em câmaras aqui embaixo? A resposta clara é não. Porque simular em câmaras aqui em laboratórios, toda a pressão, temperatura e as condições ambientais que ocorrem na estratosfera real é virtualmente impossível. Então, não dá 
para simular esses experimentos que o Frank está propondo numa câmara. Dá para simular algumas coisas. Por exemplo, na câmara de aerossóis de Harvard, eles jogaram carbonato de cálcio e mediram forçante radiativa, propriedades óticas e assim por diante. Mas a complexidade é muito maior do que, que você consegue fazer numa câmara experimental. Infelizmente, senão seria fácil. Você faz aqui embaixo e imagina o que vai acontecer lá em cima. A realidade é muito mais complexa. Sim. Senhor, é, se é tão perigoso e, o senhor, e, e esse comitê não tem nem certeza do que, o resultado que isso vai ter, é, esse comitê está representando 7 bilhões e meio de habitantes no planeta. O, 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 o senhor acha que deveriam realmente ficar pulverizando isso na atmosfera? Ok, um, so what I will say is that the experiment itself is not dangerous. Um, so I think, to be clear again, the, the amount we're injecting with the experiment is so little that there's no risk from the actual material. The biggest risk is that the balloon crashes and falls down, just like any other stratospheric uh, balloon. The, what, the reason we're doing this research is to actually try and evaluate better how big those risks really are. So I'm not saying that we should do geoengineering with calcium carbonate in the end, because I think we know far too little to say this. I think what I'm saying is that we should do research on this in case it could be an option in the future that may have less risks than sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid, we already know some of those risks. They have these big first order impacts. For calcium carbonate, the hypothesis is it may have less risks, but we don't know that. So the whole idea of this research is not, I'm not saying we should do this. To be quite honest, I hope we'll not get into a situation where we're going to be injecting millions of tons of materials into the stratosphere. Because the idea that you can do that without impacting the Earth system in some way, I think, is somewhat utopian. But the question is, well, can we find materials where you'll do it less? And to know that, we need to do research. Frank, uh, could you argue that the risk is not so much in the experiment itself, but in the model? Yes, well, I want to be very careful with that. As an experimentalist, I don't want to stick my neck out, but I actually think, you know, the experiment we are doing, the, 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 let's say the risk of moral hazard is that, for example, what you're referring to. So when I, one of the things I worry about more, the risk of our experiment, people look at a lot because it's symbolical. But what I actually think is also partly dangerous is when you have model results, and then you think that those model results and geoengineering doesn't look so bad in them, and that you then immediately think that's the model is what the world is like. Our experiment will actually will not tell you in anything about what the world is like directly. What that comes out is from these models. And so in some sense, I actually agree. I think the risk of misrepresenting what models mean, what the uncertainty in models is, in some ways higher, but I'm not a modeler, and so I want to be very careful in not criticizing modelers too much here. But I think it's important to look at some of these aspects for models, yes. I'm not sure I answered your question, but. Okay, exactly 12:15. So we'll finish the first session. Terminamos a primeira sessão. E eu queria lembrar que à tarde nós vamos começar a investigar quais são os possíveis impactos dessas técnicas, né? O Brandini vai falar sobre impactos nos oceanos. O Jean Ometo vai falar sobre os impactos na floresta amazônica e nos ecossistemas terrestres. E nós vamos começar a analisar também, por exemplo, qual é o potencial do uso do pré-sal, por exemplo, nessas técnicas. Então, eu acho que vamos ter uma tarde com muitas discussões interessantes. Esperamos vocês aqui às uma e meia da tarde. Obrigado pela atenção, gente. <risos>